Hey, what's up, Putin puppets? We are <laughs> four white guys with different kinds of facial hair. Uh, we would each be different iterations of European pop music on both sides of the Iron Curtain from the mid 60s to the early 90s. And uh, we're here. We're here with Kit Clarenberg and Alex Rubenstein. Uh, that's our Belgrade Bureau. And we got Wyatt Reed. Wyatt, where are you right now? You're somewhere in uh, flyover country. Kentucky. And then Eastern okay. Kentucky. All right. Well, that, that's racist. Well, um, we'll get into that in a little bit, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and I'm... I, I uh, hired a, a PR team through um, Rudy Giuliani and cleaned up a little bit so I can appeal more to a cosmopolitan crowd. I'm your host, Oliver Anthony. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> kind of trimmed the beard a little bit. It's a good um, look. It's a new, but it's good. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I'm, well, I'm, I'm doing a song that's less fat phobic next time. I'm sure that will convince the libs. That'll convince all the cool left-wing influencers uh, that a, a clunky song with elements of class war is, is okay. But we'll get it. We'll, we'll talk about that. I mean, we'll talk about a lot of – we'll talk about whatever. We're just going to kind of wing it today. Um, we don't have Aaron, award-winning Canadian journalist Aaron Maté with us because Aaron is finishing his book, hopefully. He's, at, he's on a book deadline. And uh, so he got the week off and I'm hoping his book will be done because it's, you know, it's on everything Aaron has been monomaniacally focused on, except the OPCW, but Ukraine, Russiagate, it needs to come out. And it, it's uh, with OR Books or OR Books. I don't know what they call themselves. And they're really good at rushing books to print. So I do hope to see that in print. Um, but we, we're here with the, the team today, uh, which will hopefully be the gray zone you know like real official made man at the gray zone um it with your support and so far we have been getting a lot of support we have a fundraiser going at gofundme which means there's like a 49 percent chance i'll ever get the money because the fbi might steal it but we've we we're doing very well and this is a fundraiser for the three contributors you see to my left uh, it's to give them long-term positions to reward their dedication. I mean, you all know and benefit from their hard work. And so we're here to support them today. So far, 711 people have donated. And all of this money is going to them. So I'm going to throw the link in the chat. Don't send me, you know, uh, okay, if you're, if you're already a, a patron, then don't worry about it. Um, but don't send me super chats. And I mean, you can feel free to do that if you want to ask a question or something, but go to that link right there and donate because you're, you're donating directly to these hardworking independent journalists and guaranteeing them a position for maybe two years, um, some stability, which is really rare in independent media, especially if you don't uh, take the position of the State Department. So I'm going to keep well, throwing that. Yeah, I'll just say, you know, uh, I, that's totally right. But but, you know, it's not just a donation. I, I want to be clear. You know, it's not just that you're donating to us like charity cases. Right. This is about the gray zone being really one of the only, if not the premier hard hitting anti-imperialist investigative news website out there. And we can only do it with help from our supporters, from the people that, uh, you know, we're speaking to right which is you guys and uh so you know this isn't just you know charity this is an investment in keeping real news alive you know that's a, it's just something i wanted to point out yeah i mean i'm not gonna belabor the i'm not i'm not gonna make it into like a pacifica fundraiser where like, <laughs> you're listening to like gene ammons and milt jackson and some good jazz and then all of a sudden like the guy comes on for like 25 minutes talking about how you have to donate and thanking all the donors by name. We've gotten some incredibly encouraging messages from people who have supported us so far uh, at GoFundMe. And it means a lot to me. I can't thank you all by name. Um, but you all know what 
Wyatt, Alex, and Kid have been doing uh, for us. And it's really the backbone of our site and what makes us excel, not just doing these streams, but doing actual print journalism, like working with leaked classified documents, working with like doing field journalism, why it's reported from the front lines in Donbass. That, that is, you know, what we're, we're actually trying to compete with legacy media on their own, on our own terms. And so you're going to allow us to do that. Um, and also we're just right about a lot of things. I'm not saying that other people aren't right. Or there, are, there are other great Literally sites everything. out there and there are other people who might be even more right than us, but we've been, no. we've been right. Uh, and we've been telling you what was going to happen uh, ahead of time. I mean, the, the Putin puppets were right about the counteroffensive. It was obvious. Mm. And we've been covering that week after week, but we've also been providing details on some of the blueprints kit for uh, what the Ukrainians would do as the, as the counteroffensive failed, resorting to uh, terror tactics, kind of, you know, becoming like a white cis style army attacking the Kerch bridge, running drones into Belgorod, running drones into Moscow, because the British uh, military intelligence apparatus had been conceiving a lot of those plans and we obtained them and you reported them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, yes, the, the, the strikes, the strikes on Crimea were to be, you know, or attempted in, in most cases were to be expected because yes, this is just, you know, an utterly desperate situation and they, they need some positive headlines. Um, I, I, I saw it reported, I think it was today or perhaps you know, late, late, late last night that the British and American military advisors who helped Ukraine plan this counteroffensive knew it was going to be a mass slaughter, um, but they figured that the Ukrainians would be fine with um, you know, high casualties um, in, in return for um, recapturing territory. Of course, they've got one and, and not the other. Um, but yes, um, I mean, increasingly we see in the media the, the, um, the, 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 the negative perspectives on um, in, from within Ukraine itself on on, on the uh, proxy war are becoming more you know, more recurrent. There was a New York Times article not long ago. Um, it's the, the, the mothers of numerous. Um, you know, Ukrainian students who'd been forcibly conscripted and then sent to their their deaths with minimal training. Um, you know, in order to try and hold you know a potentially strategically you know in, insignificant town of of some variety. So I mean, and and yes, um, you know, earlier this week we reported. They, uh, the, the, the Wall Street Journal has acknowledged that you know the, the rate of amputees among um, uh, Ukraine in casualties is between twenty thousand to fifty thousand, which is like absolutely staggering. Um, so yeah, the, the, it's going quite so badly the media can't deny it anymore. I mean, whether we're any closer to the end of this, I don't know. Um, but yes, um, it, it, uh, America's friends in, in Britain are very keen to keep this going. And as we reported last year, um, were pushing the Ukrainians and helping train the Ukrainians to carry out terror attacks it, uh, against Crimea, um, constructing this partisan army that we live amongst the people and live in the woods. Um, you know, all just com complete insanity. But I guess I suppose that we're, we're, we're seeing the fruits of that labor now. Yeah, so we obtained leaks that you reported on the construction of a kind of Ukrainian partisan army or a terror army, and and you know, I mean, we're see you were seeing that with the drone attacks in civilian areas in Moscow. They're not doing much to ch uh, change the daily lives of Muscovites, uh, but we've also seen these attacks on Kerch Bridge. And you reported the blueprint that this uh, kind of cabal within British military intelligence led by Chris Donnelly, the architect of the Integrity Initiative secret troll farm had conceived, which laid out plans for attacking the bridge. And it's been attacked again and again. It's not, again, it's not doing much, but I think this is what we're going to see in the long term after the second, I don't even know if there's going to be a spring counteroffensive after that fails. But um, I want let, let's get to your latest piece. Um, this really spells out why the counteroffensive, one reason why the counteroffensive has completely failed and why I don't know what they're talking about uh, in the spring, but there might not there might not be an army in the spring for this or a Ukraine. Uh, second chance, a Ukrainian army. Uh, but this is 
a piece you just wrote, Western press fetishizes yeah. Ukrainian amput. And I, I found this photo um, just from a medical clinic that has offices across the U.S. that's taking in Ukrainian amputees because there's so many of them. They basically have to be farmed out throughout Europe and the United States. And this is a veteran who lost his arm. Um, and what you did that I think is so significant in this piece, Kit, is you extrapolated out of the total reported by the Wall Street Journal of Ukrainian amputees, the possible total of casualties. And it's it's staggering. It's shocking. I mean, a substantial slice of the entire Ukrainian population has been lost to this proxy war, which is being guided from Brussels and Washington. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, there, was a very, there was an absolutely remarkable um, statistic published by an, an institute in Kiev recently, which was that 78% of Ukrainians um, know, know someone or are related to someone who's died. Um, in the war, which is just you know kind of completely unimaginable, like you know, like transpose that, that you know transpose that data to the US or the UK. I mean, it would just it, I mean it, 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 absolutely shocking. But yeah, it's so I mean that the, the, that that article was very that Wall Street Journal report was very revealing. And yes, like if you look at past US um, uh, medical and military studies of the rate of amputations in war, they're pretty static, despite um, uh, the you know, developments in, 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 in science and, uh, uh, and healthcare. Uh, but also, I mean, you know, Ukraine does not have access to all of those benefits. And in fact, there was this remarkable quote from um, a Ukrainian physician who said that now amputee centers in um, Ukraine need to be as common as dentists. Like the, you know, every every village, every town, every city has to have one or more. Um, it's it, yeah, it's just it, it's it's mind-boggling, really. And yes, like, I mean, it's a reflection of how things have just gotten so bad that they can't suppress it anymore. Um, you know, I think like a lot of arguments about uh, well, you know, Ukrainian agency that they're just they're just totally they're rendered rather invalid now. Like you know, like people are being forcibly conscripted against their will. People are being sent to the front line. Yes, with minimal training, a, a large proportion of, of the population are feeling it directly. Like cemeteries have been excavated and, and enlarged, like the graves of like people who died in World War One and Two, like moved uh, to accommodate this just mass kind of daily influx of bodies from the front line. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 if this was you know the U.S. or British military um, that was sending just scores and scores and scores, you know, unaccountably vast numbers of people to their almost most certain deaths. I think what was the what was the life expectancy in back at the peak of fighting like four hours? Um, you know, yeah. this, this would be national scandal and grounds for a palace revolution. Um, you know, in in Ukraine, the government has an you know an enormous stranglehold um, on the flow of information. Um, the, the, the Ukrainian um, citizens likely have no idea or very little um, idea from at least from news reporting on um, you know how bad things are. And of course, if you're an independent blogger or you know happen to have relatives in Russia, as many Ukrainians do, and you phone them, you can end up in prison for you know ten years uh, or like or so for you know challenging the the government's narrative. Um, as uh, you know, Gonzalo Lira allegedly is. Um, you know, you know, now facing now facing trial and, and uh, you know, many years hard labour. Um, I mean, quite what's quite what's happening with him, we don't know. But yes, I mean, he's that, he is not an isolated case uh, by any by any stretch of the imagination. And despite this, um, you know, despite this total blackout on the reality of the front line for, for most Ukrainians, if you look at polls, when Ukrainians uh, are polled anonymously, i.e., they don't have to state who they are or you know any kind of identifying information, their support for a negotiated settlement or just ending this outright. Um, is that it, you know, it kind of steadily increased? It, it has increased over time. Uh, you know, people just want to get on with their lives, uh, and, you know, without the risk of um, their, you know, their city being razed to the ground or then you know, needing to be evacuated. Uh, yeah, um, it, 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 Western politicians seemingly seem to slowly but surely be losing their, their appetite for this. And of course, you know, this is a major distraction from from a from any coming war war with China. Um, so, and you know, in in January this year. There was a report from Rand, which stated that yes, this is taking up too much of our time and energy, and we need to focus on Taiwan and stoking another proxy war there. So, I mean, yes, it, 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 
it's um, obviously one wants to be optimistic and that yes this might be over soon and you know tens of thousands of ukrainians will stop being killed on a regular basis uh, for you know literally no reason other than a british and american desire to um kill russians um, right. I forget the name oh. of that official who said it was their best investment ever, like just because we get to kill Russians now. Right. It's quite remarkable. Yeah, I think Hillary Clinton said it was a great investment. I mean, we keep hearing that it's a great investment. Aaron David Miller, uh, you know, he was a peace processor who kept uh, mm. making sure that uh, the Israelis could build more settlements under guise of the peace process. He was a U.S. peace processor. Now he's at the uh, Carnegie Endowment, which is the former think tank of uh cia director william burns and he made some revealing comments recently he said that the u.s is stuck in an investment trap in ukraine but essentially the war is lost um and then we have this front page article from the washington post which calls the counteroffensive a complete failure um <laughs> i mean it, it doesn't get any more clear than this wyatt and alex yeah well this is what we're seeing right now is kind of this narrative shift where they talk about this in the article about the blame game that's that's starting to develop between different policymakers in Washington and people in Europe. The blame game, really, they're starting it themselves because no one has been selling this proxy war quite as hard as the mainstream media, specifically the Washington Post and the New York Times, who have been all in from this on this from the very beginning, who have been selling us hard this entire time on this idea that first of all that proxy war with russia is desirable and second of all that it's somehow winnable um the fact of the matter is it's you're not going to be able to win a proxy war with russia on their periphery halfway across the world uh, you know it's just it's it's we we could get into that but really the the, the counter offensive i mean to me this all of us have been saying before the counteroffensive started for months since at least January, since the idea of a counteroffensive was being floated, all of us have been warning that this is not something that's going to work out for the West, let alone Ukraine, um, which at this point, uh, the, the, the coverage itself is so disgusting. Um, when you when you read what's in the Washington Post, what they're saying about this, you know, they they describe it as as, you know, you even had Mark Milley, right, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who who pointed to this remark that he made a few months ago when he said, um, he, well, he said just just a, a couple days ago, he said, quote, I had said a couple months ago that this offensive was going to be long, it's going to be bloody, it's going to be slow. And that's exactly what it is, long, bloody, and slow. And it's a very difficult fight. What they don't mention is, you know, that was one remark that was couched in a whole bunch of other language talking about how it's totally worth it to continue this proxy war. Um, but uh, this, this Washington Post article makes clear, they say, quote, while not achieving its objectives, Milley noted Kyiv's success in degrading Russian forces. The Russians are in pretty rough shape. They've suffered a huge amount of casualties. Their morale is not great. So even though this counteroffensive is an utter failure. They haven't even reached the first of three defensive lines. They're still miles away from the first line two months in. But it's okay because we've degraded Russia's military capabilities. This is the same thing that they've been saying this entire war, right? Since April 2022, I remember uh, the Defense Secretary uh, Lloyd Austin, who uh, moonlit right as a a board member of Raytheon, Raytheon yeah. in a totally unrelated uh, development. Uh, he said, you know, two months after things got hot, that the goal in supporting Ukraine is to, quote, see Russia weakened to the degree that it cannot do the kinds of things that it has done in invading Ukraine. So that's, you know, from that perspective, this is a, a, a success just from the fact that we have somehow degraded Russia's military capabilities for the time being, right? Uh, because I suspect that uh, at this point, it looks like when, not if, when uh, Russia emerges much more victorious from this conflict on the Ukrainian side, uh, I suspect that they're going to be investing very heavily in uh, their military industrial complex and restoring it and expanding its capabilities. Yeah. Um, and, so and they're, 
at, at, the, at this point, the, their production capacity for just munitions is outpacing the U.S. I mean, the U.S. can't provide mm -hmm. enough munitions. They're relying on the, you know, the, they're relying on what Donald Rumsfeld called New Europe, all the tools to send uh, their <clears throat> entire stocks. Lithuania is sending anti-tank uh, missiles and howitzers, which means uh, they must not be that afraid of a Russian invasion. All that talk of Putin moving mm. west and subsuming all the Baltic states is phony. You have this talk of a spring offensive. We're just doing an operational pause and we're just we're just going to chill. Everybody needs um, some self-care time right now. The self-care bear is coming to Kiev or Kiev and then in spring, we're going to have attackums and F-16s, and we're going to do combined arms. Uh, NATO, you know, NATO loves all this stuff about combined arms when what they're really fighting is a good old-fashioned Soviet war with fortified cities and trenches, and the Russians are doing a better job uh, just because they're going to their core doctrine here. The, they're talking about combined arms in the spring, but then you have buried in that piece that I just threw on screen a few minutes ago in the Washington Post which is just John Hud Hudson speaking, uh, Soto, we've lost uh, Clarenberg, uh, speaking Soto Voce for yeah. the uh, uh, National Security Council. He quotes an unnamed senior administration official saying the F-16s and attackums would have made no difference whatsoever. He, he <laughs> says it clearly. So why are we going to send F-16s if they're Biden administration, which has made this war one of their, I mean, this is not just a, geopolitics for them this is politics this is domestic politics for them if this fails their re-election campaign is in danger they're saying it straight up there's no point in sending any more of these weapons uh ukrainians are not going to hold crimea hostage be able to force Russia. so why would they send those weapons well of course contractors and to offload all of our surplus garbage. That brings me to my next point. We saw a NATO official declare that Ukraine as a rump state could become, and, and this is always like the room in the rumor mill, would become part of NATO in exchange for giving Russia Lugansk, Donetsk, and Crimea. And then he had to apologize, of course, but they were floating that idea it was a trial balloon. Why would Russia even have to accept that now? I mean, you had K K Kadyrov, the leader of Chechnya, say there's no point in us negotiating now because we're kicking so much ass on the battlefield. We can just go on an offensive on our own potentially and start taking even more territory, build the, the land bridge to Transnistria, uh, go through, uh, just rampage through Odessa. I mean, that's the position the West put itself in by first refusing to negotiate and sending Boris Johnson to Kiev in April 2022, and then rejecting negotiations after these gains that were supposedly made around Kharkiv with the Kharkiv counteroffensive. Now they're not even in a position to bring Russia to the table, and it doesn't look like they will be. So I don't know well, who this, wants to, yeah. The, 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 I mean, that's the, the ultimate irony here is that these people call themselves pro-Ukrainian. They are pro-Ukrainian death. They are people who knowingly, because yeah. according to this article, that the United States, the UK ran joint war games with Ukraine well before this happened and knew this would happen. Great point. They knew this would happen. They all knew this would happen. We all knew this would happen. Anybody who's been paying attention to this, who understands the power dynamics of play, knew this would happen. And they said, you know what? It's worth it. It's worth it to be able to degrade Russia's military capability. It is worth it to send 50,000 Ukrainian boys to the slaughter. Yeah, that here's Aaron Mate. It. More proof that the U.S. sees the Ukrainians as cannon fodder. The U.S. U.K. helped formulate a battle plan that, quote, anticipated Ukraine taking heavy losses. But they envisioned Kyiv accepting the casualties as the cost of piercing through Russia's main defensive line. Instead, after suffering major casualties, this is the Washington Post reporting the reality, Ukraine chose to stem the losses on the battlefield. So their vision required the, nerve. the Ukrainians to the sacrifice. Nerve. Imagine that. And, and this is a psyop <laughs> against the Ukrainians. So the British and the U.S. run the war games. Then they present it to the Ukrainians and say, look. Your initial wave is going to get hit hard, but then you're going to penetrate through the minefields and you're going to come in with 
you know, artillery, electronic warfare, and then you're going to have all these reinforcements that are going to gain ground. The Ukraine, and that was never going to happen. So they just tricked the Ukrainians into dying more. They tricked the Ukrainians and they tricked all of their audiences into believing that not only was it possible, it was likely, and we should just keep sending them more weapons to make it even more likely. And 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 the you know the really truly horrendous thing about this is that no one who is actually responsible for just feeding endless Ukrainian boys into this meat grinder, no one is going to be held accountable. Joe Biden and Victoria Nuland are never going to be you know brought up before the ICC, despite them knowing that this would happen, them knowing. First of all, pushing Ukraine into NATO for years and years and years, creating this, you know, the, the circumstances that made this conflict inevitable. And then once they knew it was happening, then they continue just just sh shoveling as many, you know, just just it, it, it's horrific. Just shoveling as many boys into this death trap as they can get their hands on. They're literally running around Ukraine beating kids over the head and dumping them in vans and then pushing them out on the front lines with three weeks of basic training. It's horrendous. It is horrifying. And I'm not somebody who takes pleasure in seeing anybody die. And, and you know, it's just, if you were on the side of peace, you were on the side of some negotiated settlement. Well, they destroyed that. They made that impossible. So now from the Russian perspective, we just have to destroy this trap that they have turned our once brother nation into because there's no alternative and there's no one uh who is over there to, to reasonable to negotiate with everyone's you know Unc uncle joe's asleep at the wheel and the neocons uh you know not that that biden is anything but but that's who's running you and i united states foreign policy whether it be in ukraine or whether it be in niger yeah so i want to get to alex uh well, can I just add a, add a few thoughts on, on this subject? I think that like Ukrainians have to be getting wise to all the things that we've been saying, which is that they're they're getting played. Um, there was a uh, an article from War on the Rocks, which is like a think tank podcast that said that many Ukrainian soldiers were learning to use the weapons that they were being provided with by the West by watching YouTube videos. Um, there was that Washington Post article a couple of weeks ago where it was the wife of a, a soldier who had lost a limb. And she said she wants the counteroffensive to be more active. We've got all these guys coming back from the front line without limbs. Uh, I want the price they paid to be reasonable. Otherwise it's just useless what they went through. So why did the Washington post run that quote? Like either they're unable to find anybody in Kiev that's supporting the counteroffensive and, and, and wants to keep sending young men in or, they're trying to sow the seeds for for a, a, a drawdown from this conflict. I don't I don't know which it is, but you know, there's plenty of people. They didn't have to run that quote, so there's there's an obvious reason. Um, so so let's hear from Jake Sullivan really quickly, uh, Human Scarecrow and National Security Council Director Jake Sullivan on the counteroffensive. This is a tweet by John Hudson, who's the author of the Washington Post article. And as I um, suspected, I mean, I think Jake Sullivan was kind of feeding him a lot of this for the article. But when is this guy going to be held accountable? I mean, the Ukraine counteroffensive and the proxy wars going the way of the 2016 Hillary Clinton campaign that he ran as her campaign manager. So here he is. Yeah. Hey, Jake, the Washington, Post, or the Washington Post reported overnight that the U.S. does not expect Ukraine's military to be able to reach an elite topple. Is that an accurate assessment of their counteroffensive right now? Is that an accurate? So I'm not going to speak to intelligence reports. I will say that over the course of the past two years, there have been a lot of analyses of how this war would unfold coming from a lot of quarters. And we've seen numerous uh, changes in those analyses over time as dynamic battle for con battlefield conditions change. So what we have said from multiple podiums and multiple briefings remains the same, which is we're doing everything we can to support Ukraine and its counteroffensive. We're not gonna handicap the outcome. We're not gonna predict what's going to happen because this war has been inherently unpredictable. Uh, and that's all I can say today, other than I believe and have confidence in the capacity and especially the bravery of the Ukrainian fighters uh, to continue to make progress on this. He sounds kind of like a polished Yale version of a NAFO troll who's trying to cope with the cope and seethe you know uh, i just he's love that he says a nice <laughs> Alex. i just love that he says this war has been unpredictable when you know us at the gray zone have been 
right every step of the way. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. wh wh while the uh, NAFO, you know, Ukraine expert class of people uh, predict predicted a uh, you know a beach party in Crimea next year by next year. You know, yeah, um, I think uh, wasn't like uh, Lizzo scheduled to play there. She was going to play uh, <laughs> Stepan Bandera's flute made of the bones of ethnic <laughs> Polish children. Um, well, then it, her, the sexual harassment suit blew up the whole cr Crimean. Ruined party, it. So. Ruined you know, it. <laughs> there, I, I'm not sure if you guys saw this, but Cy Hirsch put out a, a piece a couple days ago, kind of dissecting the failed Jeddah peace summit. Uh, you guys remember yeah. when yeah, 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 they yeah. decided to have a peace summit and they only invited one side? Yeah. Um, <laughs> like they're, they're just negotiating amongst themselves. Um, it was an utter failure, right? Nothing happened, and that's why the news immediately pretended that it had never happened. Uh, but Cy Hirsch said uh, that he spoke to an American intelligence official who said that, quote, Jetta was Sullivan's baby, Jake Sullivan's baby. He planned it to be Biden's equivalent of Pre President Woodrow Wilson's Versailles, the grand alliance of the free world meeting in a victory celebration after the humiliating defeat of the hated foe to determine the shape of nations for the next generation. Fame and glory, promotion and reelection. The jewel in the crown was to be Zelensky's achievement of Putin's unconditional surrender after the lightning spring offensive. They were even planning a Nuremberg type trial at the world court with Jake as our representative. Just one more fuck up, but who's counting? 40 nations showed up, all but six looking for free food after the Odessa shutdown. Um, so you, know, you just have these scathing kind of, and, and it's not just Cy Hirsch though anymore. I, I also, I forgot to put this in the document that we were uh, collaborating on, but um, when we were talking about the, the, just the utter, chaos and disarray in the Ukrainian armed forces, how they're just going out conscripting anybody they can find. Uh, even The Guardian, which has been, again, like up there with Washington Post and New York Times as one of the premier cheerleaders of this proxy war. Even they, uh, four days ago, put out an article called Bribes and Hiding at Home, the Ukrainian men trying to avoid conscription. Um, yeah. And they quoted a, a factory owner in eastern Ukraine who can't get any of his workers to show up because none of them want to get thrown into the meat grinder, right? Uh, and he said, quote, I met a guy who told me he was taken from the street, and within a week, his unit was starting to attack a village near Bakhmut. He told me, what the fuck? It is the first time I picked up a rifle, and after a week, I go to attack this village. He was shot twice, once in the arm and once in the back. And he went on to say that in Ukraine now, quote, there are two categories of people. One is already in the army, and the other is too scared to go outside so as not to be conscripted, and no amount of salary will make them leave their houses. So that's that's the point we're reaching now, where it's just no longer, it's a failed state, right? Um, the, the kind of like trust that you need to have to be able to, in the rest of your, you know, community, to be able to go outside, that's not there anymore. Yeah. Um, so that, so that quote sounds like also like NAFO, uh, no amount of salary will convince them to leave their houses. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 th I, th I mean, on, 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 a, on a serious note as well, like we just, we just, th th this bears repeating because it feeds into so much of, of uh, the work that we've been doing over the past, well, 18 months now is the fact that, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Like, like, yeah, as we mentioned, like Britain um, sabotaged the April 20, 2022 uh, peace talks, which uh, produced apparently a signed um, uh, treaty uh, under which Russia would withdraw from um, Ukraine and the, um, the two breakaway republics would be given independence slash uh, you know, would be annexed by Russia. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the idea that U Ukraine will get anything like that in any um, um, uh, peace agreement now is, uh, is, is laughable. But so it, like Britain's um, uh, uh, involvement in keeping this going and grinding on and getting, you know, untold numbers of Ukrainian uh, Ukrainians killed um, it, it, on, on the front line. It, it wasn't just restricted to um, behind the, the scenes lobbying of, of Zelensky and tell, telling him that you know we're not ready for you to uh, uh, to stop just yet. Like there was also a dedicated on um, online censorship effort run by this very shadowy British government unit um, called the the Counter Disinformation Unit. There's virtually no information on it online at all. Um, you know, it, it's been confirmed that it is staffed by intelligence and security uh, professionals who are um, uh, experts at behavior change 
um, i.e. manipulation and psychological warfare. Now, they were, were this has been admitted that they, they were policing narratives online around Buka and Maria Pol, particularly um, the, uh, the, the ever mystifying alleged massacre of scores of um, civilians by Russia, by Russian forces as they were leaving under the terms of the negotiated um, settlement that Johnson ruined. Um, so, like, yeah, the, 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 it, it's quite clear that they did not. They that the uh, London wanted to overtly and covertly ensure that no one um, uh, was presented with any alternative viewpoint or indeed facts on you know what did or did not happen in Bukha. And yes, the purpose was to frame this narrative of of, of, of genocide. And now, yeah. you, you know, our our dear friend Paul Mason. Um, we know from um, you know our, our reporting on on his uh, his leaked emails. Paul like Mason, he British was in touch who, with yeah. Paul Mason, British journalist, uh, proposing as a socialist uh, veteran revolutionary Trotskyist who uh, Kit and I exposed as a security state collaborator. Uh, just so for some background for our American <laughs> viewers. Yeah, indeed. If, you, if you're lucky enough to not know who Paul Mason is, um, you know, uh, but yeah, in effect, so like, we, yeah, we reported on a series of leaked emails in which he was directly coordinating his attacks on anti-war, anti-imperialist leftists with a high ranking British intelligence official known as Andy Price. Now, um, in the wake of Bucha, uh, Paul Mason were, was um, uh, in secret coordinating with with academics um, and uh, uh, this the counter disinformation specialist um, Amal Khan. Um, it, it, it specifically, he was interested in attacking people who were challenging the official narrative of what happened in Bucha. Now, I mean, he was quite clearly tasked with doing that by um, Andy Price, this high ranking British intelligence official. One wonders how many. British journalists are in um, uh, Andy Price's Rolodex and were similarly, um, you know, t uh, tasked with this. this. This was hugely significant from Britain's perspective. They wanted to frame this narrative of genocide, which the UN has investigated and found to be completely fraudulent. Um, they what they wanted to keep this going, and Bucha was kind of like ground zero for this. Now, in the immediate aftermath of Bucha, Lukashenko. Um, so make of this what you will, stated that he had evidence that British special forces were involved in the massacre. Now, um, you know, none of that's ever come to light, although you know, it might have done if Russia's request for an official UN investigation into Bucha hadn't been sabotaged by none other than Britain. So, I mean, yes, like quite you know, whether the, the British involvement in shaping this narrative extended to, yes, some kind of like fo you know, f f false flag series of killings um, isn't clear, although this would be the one time uh, that Ukraine has re recaptured territory and not carried out a massacre of you know, pro-Russian elements. Yeah, like recently we reported on, on leaks which showed that this British intelligence cabal who was, sketched the blueprints for the attacks on Kerch Bridge um, is in direct contact with the Odessa SBU. And the Odessa SBU expressed a keen interest in being able to spy on and monitor the private and, and uh, conversations and public statements of, a Russia, of Ukraine's quote and quote pro-Russia contingent. Now there have been two reports by the the, the, the UN Human Rights High Commissioner, uh, which have gotten zero uh, media coverage whatsoever. Like delving into they you know, investigate uh, uh, human rights abuses in Ukraine, and yeah, like the, you know, the SBU is completely off the leash in terms of dragging people off the street, accusing them of of being you know, Russian collaborators on usually very flimsy grounds, uh, you know, brutally torturing them, threatening to kill their families, depriving them of sleep and food and making them sign um, confessions, uh, you know, of, of, of guilt. Uh, now, yes, this is being, this is being, um, this campaign of terror is being conducted in, um, in uh, directly with British intelligence. They are using Anomaly 6, which again, well, we at the Grey Zone have exposed, um, uh, this illegal spying tool, which the British government uses despite knowing it breaches a variety of national and international data protection um, laws and regulations, and so yeah, but but the, the, of course, in that context, now that the the the, uh, the narrative is, is coming unstuck, and the the, the total catastrophe of uh, Ukraine's situation is becoming ever clearer. Britain has an even more pronounced need 
to suppress inconvenient facts such as is their central involvement in keeping this going um uh which is probably accounts for why i was stopped at luton airport and grilled for five hours under threat of arrest um you know they don't want this stuff emerging because at the very least yes it's, it's very unlikely that the individuals involved will ever be you know held accountable but at the very least it makes them look terrible um you know like absolutely terrible uh so yeah <clears throat> yeah and i mean the the so the narrative is is, is completely falling up it's fallen off apart on the counter offensive there is a lot to still learn about this war and uh, many of the propaganda set pieces like buka or bucha which you mentioned um i'm sure that i i i have this feeling that my uh analysis of the Mariupol theater explosion mm. will uh, prove to be be can be fully confirmed at some point. I mean, what, what we have right now, this the stories like the from the AP that won up Pulitzer are just an absolute joke. But I mean, at, at this point, the majority of Americans, obviously disproportionately Republican because they're not subjected to the same legacy media propaganda as Democrats are opposed to sending any more aid to Ukraine. So that's fallen apart. But another aspect of the NATO narrative that's fallen apart is that there are no Nazis in Ukraine. Um, that there's no Nazi problem. Um, that's sort of, it's important to bury that reality because liberals and the democratic party base but particularly the affluent donor class is so important to sustaining support for this war because it's biden's war it always has been biden's war ever since his son got a barisma contract and then biden flew into kiev almost the same month after um mikhailo zlochevsky the ceo of barisma told hunter biden we need help from dc almost the same month Biden flew in, Joe Biden, and declared that Ukraine needed to clean up their courts, clean up their corruption, and dangled an IMF loan, which is, is wild. I mean, it says so much about what the IMF is, that the vice president of the U.S. can just tell the IMF what to do. And he said, you ain't getting your loan unless you get rid of the prosecutor, Victor Shokin. So Biden you know, emerges as the kind of imperial lord of Ukraine at that point advancing his own, his son, his surviving son's business interests, who has a lot of experience uh, in the gas industry, Hunter Biden. And, you know, you can draw a straight line from that to the present, how important this war is personally to Biden and the Biden administration and all the people that were in the Obama administration at the time, Victoria Newland, uh, Jake Sullivan was around Hillary. They were all, you know, Tony Blinken was around, they were all around each other. They were all part of this network that saw this war as a turning point in sustaining U the U.S. as the global hegemon. And now it's all falling apart, but it was so important for them to bury the, the reality of this Nazi element in Ukraine, just because at the same time, Domestically, they're pushing anti-racism, civil rights, pro you know, progressivism, identity issues. So they can't be seen as supporting that. And and Alex, you had a piece this week that kind of I think was the final nail in the coffin of there are no Nazis in in Ukraine narrative. And it wasn't like you had to do some intense digging, although I think mm -hmm. what you did was, you know, just you just drove the point home by quoting. Uh, from the figure who met with Zelensky. But Zelensky did this. I mean, he uploaded these images to his own Telegram account, and then he tweeted this photo out. He didn't say who it was, but it was Andrei Beletsky, founder of the Azov Battalion and the self-proclaimed white leader, the, the leader of white Christianity against, in his own words, the Semite-led Untermenschen. He actually used the term Untermenschen. That's a German word, not a russian and ukrainian word that's this nice young man to the right and and you know the azov battalion is rebranded into uh what the third regiment or something well, well it's a it's a Brigade. it's a portion of the it's yeah but it was like azov special forces that that kind of got cut out from azov and 
formed into into this new outfit. But I'm really this is the you biggest know, I was thinking, Nazi in Ukraine. Zelensky's presenting yeah. him with honors here, commending him because they, you know, they put in work in Bakhmut and they're involved in the counteroffensive and well, he's desperate. This is a show of desperation. So what's what's going on here? Yeah, I mean, it is, it is a show of desperation. I'm glad that you mentioned you know, this being Biden's war. You know, Sullivan was was on the phone, was referencing the Newland phone call, the infamous one where they're planning to set up a post-coup government. But, uh, you know, let's not forget that uh, in Biden's announcement that he was going to run for president, he had footage of Charlottesville and and, and really leaned heavily into, you know, uh, what happened in Charlottesville. Um, now you have Zelensky uh, meeting with the guy who founded a group called Patriot of Ukraine, which in the words of a human rights group in Kharkov, uh, gained notoriety for its torchlit processions around universities that filled foreign students with terror. So, I mean, th this is a guy who, who has made a career out of, uh, you know, spewing anti-Jewish vitriol. Um, I think it's really important that to note that, um, you know, in Zelensky's tweet, he praised uh, Andrei Beletsky and uh, the SS, uh, the, I'm sorry, the uh, third regiment for gaining eight kilometers. So eight kilometers is seen as this massive victory for them. Um, but you that's know, the, I also that's the metric system folks. So if you're, <laughs> you're American, that's not a lot. That's not eight miles. Yeah. It would take you about um, 25 or 30 minutes to run through. Yeah. You can do <laughs> so, like, a, you can do an 8k, even if Oliver Anthony denounces you for too, eating too many fudge rounds. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think 11 months ago, I did a story for the gray zone about how Zelensky had tweeted a photo of himself uh in some frontline town i forget which uh, but in the background his bodyguard was wearing a uh nazi patch it was inspired by you know the personal bodyguard unit of adolf hitler um and when that like caught on when people realized that that was what that patch was and and that he was sharing it he deleted it he deleted it from his telegram his instagram his twitter all of it uh it's archived but you know they were they were trying to keep up appearances. It doesn't seem like he cares anymore. You know, it seems it seems like he's like he he's almost signaling to the neo Nazi forces of his country that he's that he's their guy. Why would he do that? Well, I think that he's worried about his uh, political future or perhaps his his future at all. Yeah, on this on this planet, you know. And let me just show you one thing from this video. Uh, they published forty five seconds of their meeting. With with no audio. Yeah, here's one of the guys from the third assault regiment, which is the rebrand of the neo-Nazi Azov Battalion. He's got a US flag on his hat. I mean, they're wearing they've replaced their Nazi patches with US flags. Huh. I mean, that's that's how deeply invested the US is in the Azov Battalion. Why? Because the why did the US invest itself in the uh so-called free Syrian army and then yeah. have to uh Covert, you know why? Because it was just a weapons farm for the real fighters in Nusra who actually were motivated in Syria, who were ideologically extreme and therefore motivated, and who got all the training uh, and battlefield know-how. That's what's going on here. The Ukrainian military, you have all these conscripts who can't fight, who are lasting about four hours in the field, and then you have these guys who've been fighting in the Donbass since maybe early 2015. And they're yeah. getting U.S. weapons through the official Ukrainian military after being rebranded, but they're still the same old Nazis. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes back to our first article that we did af after the war started, you and I, Max, um, where we quoted uh, Yevon Kadas, the founder of the C-14, the 14 and C-14 referring to the 14 words, um, who, you know, quickly went to the front line when the war broke out. And he said, if we get killed, it's effing great because it means we died fighting a holy war. If we survive, it's going to be even effing better. That's why I don't see a downside here, only upside. You know, so it shows it, 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 that's the that's the motivation here. It's a, it, it is a holy war for them. And you see this in the writings of uh, Andre Belitsky, which I reproduced in my most recent article that, uh, you know, he he uh he wants ukraine to uh i forget the exact term that he used but light the torch of purification in europe 
um, and basically expel it of all, uh, all all migrants of color and and of uh, and, and of Roma people and Jews and anyone else that's not of pure pure blood. Did we lose Max? Well, um, hey, I'm yeah, I'm still here. I was just uh, jumping in to write a fundraising pitch. Hey, if you're watching this, I'm going to drop a link into the chat. And if you want to support the journalists you see on screen, Kit Clarenberg, Alex Rubenstein, and Wyatt Reed, you can do so at this link right there. Uh, if you want to help them help create dedicated positions for them at the gray zone, you can do it there. That, and just imagine what we can do with them on board full time. So, uh, Wyatt, you were saying. I was going to point out that uh, to me, it's not that surprising. You see these guys, with the American flag patches. Um, this, this isn't, you know, it's kind of not really been reported on, but even a month before, uh, you know, Russia intervenes, there was a, a fascinating article that came out in Yahoo News with the headline, CIA trained Ukrainian paramilitaries may take central role if Russia invades. Um, and they talk about how the United States since 2015 had been overseeing a secret intensive training program at an undisclosed facility in the southern United States. Um, and they had uh, quite a few kind of interesting quotes in this, uh, citing uh, CIA officials. One, that, one of them said this included tactical stuff that is, quote, going to start looking pretty offensive if Russians invade Ukraine. Uh, another one said the United States is training an insurgency, uh, adding that the program has taught the Ukrainians how to quote kill Russians, how to kill Russians. So that was the that was the the courses that we've been teaching. The CIA has been teaching uh, for the past eight years. Um, and so you know when when we talk about uh, that this is Putin's war, that this is something that you know that the Russians basically wanted well no we've we've been egging this on and encouraging this um even while publicly claiming to be promoting di diplomacy uh this behind the scenes has, has always been kind of the fundamental motivation for for the u.s activity in uh ukraine and that happened under obama it took place throughout trump and you know it really expanded and exploded under biden now Yeah, it but, seems we've uh, lost Mexico. Here he is. All right. Yeah, absolutely. It has expanded, and there's they 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 seem to have no way out. I quoted Aaron David Miller earlier on the investment trap, uh, but that's a, a negative way of framing it. I mean, you have all of these figures in the Biden administration, from West Exec advisors. <clears throat> Tony Blinken helped start it. With, I think Wendy Sherman. Victoria Newland, Jen Psaki was even involved. And what they did was they finessed contracts for the tech industry through their contacts in the, in the, in the Pentagon and state department and the state department often authorizes weapons transfers. So they have skin in the game and this war has been a huge boon for the arms industry and for the contractors, the beltway contractors who really power the economy in DC through federal contracts. I mean, 60 minutes, it's not exactly <laughs> anti-war publication reported that over 50% of the of the defense department budget, which is close to a trillion dollars now goes to the contractors and the defense budget, thanks to the Ukraine proxy war is at its highest point since world war II. So why would they give up this cash cow? They just need, more and more Ukrainian men, um, and they're down to their last. They're 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 down to the Nazis as the you know trained fighters. Z Zelensky, what comes after him? You actually have Nazi ideologues coming out and saying that they opposed him initially. Um, you know, one of his chief opponents was Denis Prokopenko, who was the is now the commander, the official commander of Azov forces replacing Beletsky. I mean, he there's video of him refusing to stand for Zelensky as the Ukrainian president. Now they openly say we welcome him because he has Jewish heritage and it helps paper over our existence so we can get more weapons. So 
what happens after Zelensky, the the post Zelensky era is being postponed. That's why they're using martial law to de to delay or prevent the 2024 election in which he was going to stand for re-election. That's why uh, you're seeing all of the opposition parties getting banned because the crisis, the political crisis that the counteroffensive failure and just the failure of this entire proxy war would bubble to the surface. And who has the capacity to put muscle around the political forces that are propped up by the West that have failed internally inside Ukrainian society? It's the national core, the domestic wing of the Azov battalion. That's who Zelensky's terrified of, right? That's who he should be actually be afraid of because his whole thing is just, I mean, they, they think of him in the same way that like MAGA thinks of him. They think of him as like a comedian, celebrity Davos homosexual, as Ted Nugent called him. They just receive, they just realize he's a useful tool, but when he's no longer useful, uh, I don't know. Yeah, that's that's what I'm that's what I mean. I really think that's why he is extending this olive branch to Beletsky after years of uh, feuding with him in, in his first year in office. They had uh, a, a public showdown where where there was going there was a, a news station that was hosting a TV bridge uh, between Russian and Ukrainian civilian civilians to like facilitate uh, a stronger mutual understanding. Uh, Beletsky basically threatened to him. He said the nationalists need to talk to you. And, uh, and, 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 um, and, and, you know, you need to have this canceled in, in, the, in one day's time, or we're going to have a conversation. Uh, Zelensky did come out against it. And actually the SVU opened up a criminal investigation into this news outlet. And, uh, it's actually since been shuttered for being, you know, allegedly pro-Russian as part of Zelensky's crackdown on, on, uh, dissenting media. Um, and then, you know, just a year just uh, just a few months later in Zolo, as we reported in our in our original piece, I love this as a as background music to it or a background visual. This is Zelensky yeah. before he was president. So it's this is how the you know, if you imagine how Beletsky actually sees him. I mean, well, what did he tell him? He told him, uh, we need you to be a president. We need you to not be a clown, not an artist from oligarch corporations, um, but a president at war. Um, and then, so, you know, a few months later, uh, as part of like a, you know, a peace process that Zelensky had gotten elected on for, because people were tired of the hostilities that by that point already in 2019, uh, Zelensky ordered troops to leave, uh, Zolot, which was, you know, being used to, uh, fight the Donbass. And he was stood down by Azov. They, they said, we're not leaving. And Beletsky threatened to send thousands more troops so now you know they have a very public history of, of of going at each other and now all of a sudden they're friends you have to imagine that the reason that they're meeting is probably because Zelensky is so afraid of them so yeah that was Zelensky uh when he was sort of a nationally known comedian obviously it was parody uh but there are a lot of parodies that now are being there you know, parody eventually becomes tragedy. And that's the point that we're at now. Uh, in kind of, in, 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 you know, and that also is, I mean, someone said, no wonder liberals love this guy. Uh, yes. I mean, liberals love him because he is, he came in as a, a voice of peace and is surrendered. Um, and the only thing left is the veneer of a guy who was a draft dodger wearing a military uniform, looking like a kid dressed up as GI Joe for Halloween, uh, to make to and to and to fight this Russian menace that the liberal member of Congress Jamie Raskin has portrayed as the face of global racism, homophobia, and fascism. And here you have this Jewish leader uh, who has been embraced by the world and appears at the Oscars and every other award ceremony and um, is 
paying his country, paying his countrymen through an innovative, uh, an innovative digital currency app. That's, I mean, it, it's, it's a complete fantasy and the reality on the ground is something that he covers up. So after Zelensky, I don't know how any of this can be sustained, but the, I mean, I think the, the agenda is forget about the counteroffensive, forget about spring. The West just wants to hold on to Ukraine for as long as possible as a kind of anti-Russian porcupine like Taiwan right. to be able to get the, we the weapons contract. And um, as long as they can keep Zelensky there, they'll do it. But that is what Ukraine is going to be into the well into the future. And Russia's I, I don't see them you know, taking Kiev and bringing down the entire Ukrainian state. I don't know how they can do that militarily or politically. And it's funny because they kind of, in the media, they treat the counteroffensive now like it's just happened June, yeah. July. Like it was just this recent while. phenomenon. I just, looking on the Washington Post, I found an opinion called by David Ignatius uh, from August 31st, 2022, from a year ago. It's titled, Ukraine's counteroffensive is more than just bravado. Um, and they are, they are hyping up this because it, it kept it's also hard. amputees it was supposed to be the spring offensive you know it was, it was they've been talking about this since a year ago they've been hyping this up as though this is somehow going to you know end the war and bring putin to his knees and it's just it's always been total fantasy yeah uh well, and this was supposed to weaken Russia on the, not just like in terms of its military and its economy with the sanctions, but it was supposed to weaken Russia as like a, as like a member of the so-called international community. It was supposed to isolate it politically. Meanwhile, Russia has just gained a new ally in West Africa. So, you know, it's, it's clearly not going that, that way. It's only brought Russia and China closer to each other, which is what, we were saying from the get-go, we said that the sanctions wouldn't work. Uh, these right. kinds of sanctions don't work against a, 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 a an economy like Russia's. Uh, you know, right. I think that they can come up with pretty quickly alternatives to Airbnb and Netflix, um, right. or you know, just pirate things. So, you know, all all of the things that we've been saying from the get-go ha have 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 happened. You know, today, uh, foreign policy ran an op-ed: Should the West keep arming Ukraine or push for peace? I mean, this is can so it's it's only now that they're kind of like framing it in this like black and white, you know, right. way where where it's like either we keep arming that because like you know for so long there was this uh, game that they were playing where where peace actually meant giving them more weapons and now they're kind of mm -hmm. uh, dispelling of, the, of of that notion. And yeah, I saw a, Wyatt, for the first time. Wyatt, here's a sorry, Wyatt. Here's a tweet by you just to Alex's point. I mean, Russia has surpassed, I believe it's going to surpass Germany as the largest economy in Europe. Uh, it has done. It has done that. World Bank. Uh, and here's <laughs> Russia added 600 billion of total wealth last year, according to the Swiss bank UBS. Meanwhile, the U.S. lost more wealth than any other country last year, shedding 5.9 trillion, while North America and Europe combined got 10.9 trillion poorer. Uh, so the ruble has not been reduced to rubble, as Biden promised. Americans are getting poor, more angry. And I'm not saying it's, it's not clear that sanctions have not complicated the lives of ordinary Russians, but uh, this, doesn't, this isn't a good forecast for the economic warriors of the West. And we have BRICS coming up, the BRICS conference, right. which we will, we we're going to provide some coverage of it. And uh, that is a, I think this is the most pivotal BRICS meeting yet, although Putin won't be there. Uh, Foreign Minister of Russia, Sergei Lavrov, will. And what are they talking about? They're talking about at least creating an alternative financial system, not necessarily to take down the dollar, but to allow other countries that have been excluded to participate in the global economy. Ultimately, it's going to weaken and, and completely undermine the Western sanctions regime so Wyatt you were saying well to Alex's point this this WAPO article we've been discussing was the first time I saw them use the words hawkish to describe the desire to send more weapons to Ukraine <laughs> they were talking about hawkish Democrats 
And that's yeah. just, it's, that word has been totally absent from the right. public conversation over the past. All of a sudden, if you if you're support peace, you support sending more weapons, right? That's how it's been framed. So the fact that they were suddenly admitting that it's a, actually a militaristic position to want to send military hardware to prop up a proxy war, uh, that to me indicates again that there is there there is a, a an element within the, uh, the 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 propaganda apparatus within the deep state, quote unquote, that is trying to look for an off ramp. Um, and to y'all's other point about. Um, about Russia gaining an ally in West Africa. Well, it's not just it's not just West Africa. It's the entirety of BRICS. India two years ago was not, you know, I don't think I think there. I, I would be shocked to find out that the State Department really foresaw India's neutrality happening in the way that it did. I think they assumed that India would kind of be compliant, like a good little sort of vassal state, a good little ally, and take their side. Um, and the fact that the Indian government has not been willing to sabotage their own economy, um, just like Brazil, right? Just like uh, China and obviously South Africa, that these countries have refused to take the West side, which is seen as, as an act of like treason to them. They got rid of Imran Khan for specifically that. Mm. Um, right. But that these countries are now willing to, knowing all that, knowing how that this will be seen in the West, and they're willing to take that step anyway. Uh, it's just the the Biden kind of cabal just totally overplayed their hand. And now they're looking to get bailed out. And the rest of the world is just not going to do it. No. Uh, and we're going to hope to provide some coverage from BRICS uh, I think it's a historic development. Um, please donate to help us do that and to support these journalists that we're speaking with right now to provide them with dedicated positions. I just put a link again in the chat so uh, you can support them here. Um, Kid, I know you have to, you have some obligations. Um, I don't know if there's anything. If, if you want to jump off now or there's anything you want to leave us with, I want to talk about Pakistan. I want to talk about Niger. Um, and then we're going to talk about the culture wars that Alex has escaped from back home. But uh, kid, is there any, anything you want to? Well, yeah. I mean, I, th I, th I think it's, we're, 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 in, we're, we're at an interesting juncture where yes, like, I mean, you know, Imran Khan's dismissal, um, is a demonstration that the, U the U.S. empire it does, you know, it's 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 certainly not powerless. But then, you know, elsewhere, I mean, West West Africa is a very obvious example. But also in the Middle East, like where uh, the, the, um, Saudi Arabia and Yemen um, uh, in, 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 into peace agreement, um, which was broken by China, and then the CIA didn't see this coming. I mean, that's meant to. Be you mean in Iran? You know, actually, in, oh yeah, sorry, yeah, but I mean, in, uh, yeah, over Yemen, and the, like, I mean, that that caught so many people by surprise, um, and it led, you know, um, the CIA director to fly out to to Riyadh and ask, you know, why, what gives? Um, you know, why why did you not keep us in the loop? So yeah, I mean, it's it, you know, it its power and its reach is is declining on on, on an almost daily basis uh you know that yes that i mean in 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 west africa we as you know alex and i re reported uh there is a you know a military a military an evil military hunter which is happens to be supported by the something like 80 percent of the population in niger has come to power and has you know very quickly moved to rid its country of all foreign you know foreign influence and there was um uh you know in the immediate aftermath there was there, there was you know much chatter about whether france would would intervene or whether nigeria Nigeria would, or whether this bizarre um, uh, colonial uh, structure known as Ecobus would intervene. Now, if this had been ten years ago, like absolutely, this would have happened. Like you know, I mean, it, the, 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 there is you know, footage emerging of um, you know, vast crowds of, uh, um, of of local residents like uh, protesting outside the French embassy and telling them to uh, telling them to go home, and, and the same outside like U.S. military bases. And it's like this would have been it, 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 it's inconceivable, yeah, that like. 
10 years ago, there wouldn't have been, you know, a, you know, a direct intervention. The fact that there wasn't, and you know, they've even, the ECOBAS set a deadline, which, and said that we will absolutely invade you if you, if, 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 if this isn't adhered to, you know, that's kind of a lapse, which is like a huge loss of face. Like, you know, as, yes, I, uh, Alex and I wrote about, like, you know, France has been a, a, a reliable um, regional sheriff in Africa, for, you know, for, for, for the empire, it has staged countless coups, assassinations, interventions since uh, since 1960. Um, this is allegedly you know a period of decolonization um, in order to keep um, you know, the, the states in, in, in that part of the world uh, you know economically dependent and you know impoverished and you know, easy to exploit. You know that is a huge shift which has happened in a very brief period of time. Um, this, you know, this, this loss of power, and there's like a, you know, like, you know, a loss of face is everything with empires. A lot of the time, they trade on the threat of force or the ability to, um, uh, you know, impose sanctions. I mean, in the, um, uh, you know, the, the um, in, in my adopted home country of Serbia, the government was told, uh, you know, openly before major UN votes condemn, uh, condemning the the Russian invasion, that you know, if you don't um, vote vote to condemn, then we will sanction you and destroy your economy. Um, you know, like yeah, that, that's still a very potent threat, particularly for you know, small, poor countries like Serbia. But it's increasing, in, in, increasingly not. And I think that yeah, if you think that in in the past year we've gone from uh, you, you, uh, to, you know, talk of um, uh, boundless, unprecedented Western unity, and indeed, you know, uh, all of these supposedly neutral countries getting involved in the war effort, uh, like such as Switzerland or like you know Sweden and Norway. Um, moving to join NATO, like the, the, it, we're, we're in a very, very different place now. Like, the, yeah, again, that's another separate narrative, which is um, it has large, it, it has largely collapsed, or you know, is in the process of, uh, of collapsing. And that, that's that's not that's not insignificant. No, it's not. And you know, Wyatt, you brought up that the Democrats. There are some Democrats now being called hawkish. Uh, that reminded me of a really revealing, unintentionally revealing piece in the New York Times about the so-called anti-war movement in the U.S. Because so much of the pushback uh, against this war has come from the Freedom Caucus, the America First members of the House. The squad has not wanted to touch it. And the New York Times has a piece about why basically praising certain anti-war groups and the squad for refusing to challenge the Ukraine proxy war and basically being good Democrats. And here's one of their, the people who's been one of their anchors within the Senate uh, now at the former think tank of the CIA director, William Burns, the Carnegie Endowment, and it's Matt Duss. Uh, and he's quoting from the article, this is not a war that America started. It, it actually is. This is a war that Russia started against its neighbor, and the left generally supports a system of rules for the world in which might does not make right. Helping Ukraine defend itself upholds that principle. That's him quoting himself because he's quoted in the article. And the title of the article is, for Ukraine, many anti-war activists in the U.S. make an exception. And it's just basically about how the anti-war movement has been co-opted and then you have these groups like win without war which just completely exist to be ap uh, an apparatus of the democratic party and maybe they'll do this or that on yemen when bernie sanders is ready to make a move there but they go with the biden administration and with the democrats and matt was the guy who came in spending his life in a you know arms industry corporate backed democratic think tanks like center for american progress coming into bernie's office and making sure that bernie sanders didn't actually challenge the new cold war in fact he was uh, endorsing it again and again in speeches dust worked on in his candidacy so what this article really shows is how much the anti-war movement either doesn't exist or has just been uh turned in into an appendage of the democratic party and uh well, there, there were, I mean, I, it had to have been more than a year before any major protest was held by any of the legacy anti-war groups against the NATO proxy war in Ukraine. I mean, and the fact that Rage Against the Machine, which war was machine. like a, yeah, thank you. Rage Against the Machine is like now raging moderately in support of the machine and has like vaccine passports at their concerts. 
Um, yeah, but you know the 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 fact that this like ragtag coalition of of people just kind of came together for the first time when there's so much existing infrastructure in the anti-war left that failed to come together until, you know, for some reason, just a few weeks afterwards. <laughs> uh, <laughs> imagine that, um, you know, it, 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 it shows a lot, you know, and, and you see, uh, you see these same people at uh, every pussy hat March in Washington and, and, you know, the, the last time that that power in the West was meaningfully challenged, they were the truckers were denounced as Nazis. So, you know, because um, of one yeah, flag, right? There was one flag. Right. that somebody. Oh, that was that one, that one flag that and, and there was like and a mass same guy wearing a hat does not apply piece. to Ukraine. Right. That that principle does, has never applied to Ukraine. The fact that there are dozens of like openly sig heiling nazis posted every day is you know that 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 is just a couple bad apples but that one guy that single-handedly destroyed the entire movement you know now they're all nazis never mind yeah uh well whatever they're right wing they're far right uh but 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 yeah you had that this whole element within what comprised the anti-war movement got really uh, caught up during the pandemic and we've talked about it in uh, supporting mandates, lockdowns, and uh, you know, some of them openly wanted a, a Chinese style lockdown when the Omicron, Omicron variant uh, was introduced <laughs> and uh, they never really recovered. So the truckers for them were like the enemy because the truckers were breaking, they were beginning to break, the whole system in the social democracies from Canada to Australia run by these kind of Davos type leaders. They're, they're breaking it down. And so this element from the anti-war movement came in and uh, that, and, and, and was very vocally opposed. I remember some people I knew who were anti-war activists in Canada who had been involved in Palestine solidarity. They got involved in what they called a people's blockade to actually break the truckers, uh, attempted a, a blockade in Ottawa and they marched against the truckers. I mean, it really literally was rage in support of the machine. Uh, and they never really recovered. Uh, the Ukraine proxy war immediately followed the collapse of the mandates and the lockdowns. And the West was enshrouded in yet another PSYOP, this time in support of a crazy war against Russia that had been planned for years. And the anti-war movement, the sort of official anti-war movement within what I call the professional sectarian left, was nowhere to be found. In fact, a, a lot of their key luminaries were on podcasts uh, denouncing Putin because he was not a communist, uh, and talking about how Russia wasn't really uh, necessarily, uh, Russia was sort of a retrograde nation and you whatever. They were all confused and in disarray. It really took Rage Against the War Machine to force them to start acting and they held a little rally which i thought they just did it in spite because rage against the war machine was like the truckers it consisted of quote unquote anti-vaxxers jimmy Dore was there jackson hinkle is fat phobic so uh you know he literally got denounced as fat phobic and they just they wouldn't share the stage so they had to have their own rally and since they held their own rally a month later which was described to me by one uh, person in attendance as a bunch of Trotsky is handing pamphlets to each other since their rally. There's been no follow up. There's literally been no follow up. They haven't done anything. So they talk a lot of trash about the LaRoucheites um, being involved in Rage Against the War Machine. I think there were like one or two speakers who are affiliated with the LaRouche movement, whatever it is today. They at least they're at least doing stuff. I'm not endorsing right. Bruce or they're out there. They're, they, there's been follow up for them. They're actually working with a coalition and they had a rally outside the UN. I think last week they're doing stuff. The other well, and they're, they're challenging all these elected representatives. They're going into their town halls yeah. and they're not letting up, you know, they're just, they're keeping these people on their toes. They're doing the things that like I used to enjoy doing with, um, people in those kind of groups that I, I thought, you know, I used to have a lot of fun, like going to like interrupt, like John Bolton. I mean, Elliot Abrams is warmongering yeah. at, at John <laughs> Hopkins. 
you know, that was, that was a, like, to me, just a great moment of like, oh, you know what? Like you can just go out and find these people and hold them to account. Where are they now? You know? And it's like, if you don't like the, the LaRouche people doing it, fine, do it yourself, do it yourself then, you know? But instead just, you know, so many of these people just want to just like complain and moan about it because it's being done by the wrong people. I have to say that one one of the best interventions I've seen in that style recently is actually from our newest contributor, Liam Cosgrove, who pressed Jamal Bowman on his support for the proxy war. And Bowman revealed that he was unfamiliar with Crimea. Which no, he was, was just unfamiliar not... with the the Donbass, I think. Anyway, there was so, there was something in, in like a major region of Ukraine that he had simply never heard of that was... Uh, yeah, I'll get it on screen. Here's here's the confrontation. Well, I mean, and this is this is what I think, you know, you just go up to Capitol Hill and these guys are walking around. Any anti-war activist could do this, but Liam and there's was already a, on the hill, uh, you know, he, he, and he has credentials, but I mean, this was a great interview. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know if I know much about that. All right. <laughs> what do you want us to discuss? The Donbass in Crimea? I don't know if I know much about that. I need to get into the details and learn some more about that. Yeah. You, you know what those are? Uh, no. Tell me. What? Educate me. Well, well, let me ask you this. What, what's your opinion on the war for Ukraine? Do you support U.S. aid to the war in Ukraine? Uh, yes. Why do you Why do you support that? Because Putin's a madman, and uh, we got to stop him. <laughs> yeah, anti war in general. <laughs> Okay. All right. but I'm anti-war in general. All right. Central regions in Ukraine, uh -huh. which were in dispute and which started the war over those regions. Okay. So. Okay. To the beat. <laughs> okay. I'm anti-war in general, but Putin's a madman, <laughs> so we got to send more. I well, mean, and well, it's we just, stop him. What we should do is get him and Leslie on in a in a debate with each other. The yeah. NED official. <laughs> It'll last about 30 seconds. I mean, none of them know much about, about this, but the real, re the real reason that they're funding the war is Pelosi told them to do so. Yeah. Uh, now they have Hakeem Jeffries. I mean, it, they're, they're, it, they're not as relevant as they were before when the Democrats were in the majority in the House. Now they have Hakeem Jeffries. But Jeffries, I mean, this guy is just a complete stooge. Uh, he, they're, yeah. they're, there's no divergence from there's no space between him and the national security state or the Israel lobby as there is with Jamal Bowman. He, he, who, he's an Israel Jamal right Bowman now. has, has actually tried to challenge the U S occupation of Northeast Syria. For example, he has called Israel an apartheid state. So there is some space there, but on Ukraine, that's where Pelosi said, Nope, you cannot diverge with us on that. That is a bedrock issue. And they, and they fell into line. And that, uh, as, that as did all, yeah, that point crystallized so clearly last October when the squad put out this letter gingerly asking, oh, please, President Biden, can you please consider maybe if you don't mind thinking about diplomacy at some point? And right. they just overnight retracted that they overnight, right. you know, the Democratic leadership just leapt into action. They said, not on our watch. Peace. No, thank you. And you know, they all just tucked their tails between their legs and gave up immediately. Said, you know what? Okay, we we were anti-war and we can be pro-war, I guess, if we need to be, as long as Mama Bear asks us to. And here's Jacobin Magazine, which is the flagship publication of the DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, which endorsed AOC, really made her what she was and helped launch her career uh, when she was sort of known as an activist-y bartender. Defending her, they're defending her on Ukraine and saying Ukraine is not the only issue. This is Branko Marsitic, who's a staff writer for Jacobin, who you know publishes some useful commentaries on the Ukraine proxy war. He's taken a good position on that, but here he is defending her for taking the absolute opposite position. So you have a socialist organization that refuses to enforce an anti-imperialist line on Ukraine. And then he points to all of the things she's done, for example, to be supportive of Gustavo Petro in Colombia uh, <laughs> and, you know, to do good things in, in Puerto Rico and, you know, to just kind of paint around the edges of what the major issue is. And by the way, AOC is on her way to Latin America to 
um, to Chile to meet with like the Boric, Boric, the bread tube president who spends half his time denouncing <laughs> Nicaragua. He, she's going to go hey. to Colombia. Uh, Petro's in, in trouble there because there's a, you know, his son is being targeted and uh, I think he's been arrested. Uh, there's a clear lawfare came, campaign against Petro. Well, and, that that his his son, he is basically he. I don't think he's had a relationship with him for many years. And yeah, Petro's pol Petro's position on this is basically I'm going to let the judicial system play out, and I'm not going to intervene in it. And I hope he makes better choices. So it kind of sounds like he's saying like he's taking the opposite position of Biden and saying, you know what, like my son is a fuck up, and like I, yeah. you know sorry you know sometimes actions right. have consequences but so, so, not to distract the point no no that's an it's an important context um but petro is the first sort of left of center leader in colombia in that that we can remember because of the civil war and the reputation of the left and the role of the u.s turning colombia into the kind of israel of south america so she's going there and she's going to uh what argentina or some uh, brazil brazil, brazil. Brazil. Yeah. Okay. So the you know to see Lula, who you know she has openly embraced the squad and the sort of official um, anti-war movement that's allowed to exist in D.C., which isn't really anti-war. They've embraced Lula as well, and this is sort of the Puebla group that exists as a counterweight in many ways to the uh, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, Troika of resistance, and AOC is well, not touch that she never well, critically stays away from that critically she's she's not going to bolivia either and if for folks with a good memory she met with you know coup activists uh planning the the uh janine anya's takeover um while, while that was happening um you know so yeah it's she's she's being relegated to the periphery uh she's not allowed to confront on ukraine and they're letting her have Latin America, but you know, she's, we, we, we all saw the photos of her crying outside of the migrant center. Uh, well, she's not going to Honduras either, you know, where there is a, a new leftist government that, that, uh, that is trying to fix the conditions that caused this migrant crisis that she's, she's made such a big deal out of, but is all of a sudden silent about now that Biden's in office. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, so Basically, my overall point is about the anti-war movement. And this is just, you know, my vent session about the lack of an anti-war movement in the U.S. at such a pivotal time when this major p war, which was supposed to preserve the U.S. as a global hegemon, is falling off the rails, is that you have this large organization in the DSA whose international committee has issued a statement condemning U.S military support for Ukraine, and they support the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement on Israel-Palestine. And they're not enforcing a line on AOC. They need to kick her out of the DSA. Uh, they, But there's no line on imperialism. And then Jacobin is coming in and defending her for betraying the organization that launched her, Jacobin being the flagship publication of that organization. It's as though Grover Norquist from, uh, you know, Americans for what is it, tax whatever reform. It is, tax reform didn't like just lifted his pledge that he forces every incoming Republican member of Congress to sign in exchange for support and under threat of total political destruction uh, to not support any new taxes. It's as if sort of he he just said, well, you know, feel free to you know, vote for some tax increases. And it just shows the weakness and patheticness and desperation of, you know, left anti-war forces in just being able to have some line to Congress. And I know that the, the anti-war movement, the way it works in DC, they're, they're, they have all these NGOs and then they want to go lobby and they're like, we're going to go right. lobby. And they always lobby the same people. And they always have to be people who agree with them on like, gender ideology and abortion they'll never go lobby marjorie taylor green or any of these freedom caucus people uh who you know might be you know reactionary on social issues but they won't talk to them when they're the ones who are leading the fight on this war we had a 
who was it, Alex? Who uh, Gosar? We, we, Paul yeah, Gosar. Paul Gosar. I mean, he's regarded as like one of the most far right uh, extremists by progressives in Washington. But he introduced very important resolution to end the emergency declaration on Yemen, Libya, and Syria, which are enabling U.S. military activity in those countries. And which, I mean, the Libya emergency declaration still cites Muammar Gaddafi, who was brutally assassinated and mutilated by uh, U.S.-backed al-Qaeda forces. They still cite him as justification. So why, I mean, why not work with him on on that. But I mean, one of, to do so. one of the most important policy measures of recent time that's been proposed in Congress got absolutely zero attention from the left, from what I saw. Yeah. I wish I had, I, I wish I had written about it, but Rand Paul, he introduced uh, some kind of legislation that would have made it. So uh, the U S would not have to be involved in, in, in the event that uh, article five is invoked by NATO. So that's the mutual defense agreement. I mean, this is this is like our sovereignty. We should have some say over over what happens in that event. Don't forget, uh, it wasn't so long ago that it was said that Russia had attacked Poland. It turned out that Zelensky was lying about that, um, and, and so were the uh, you know anonymous military officials that were talking to the AP. Um, but you know, had had uh, had the trigger been pulled, uh, the U.S. would have gone to war just because a missile, a Russian missile, fell in Poland right. allegedly. So, you know, Rand Paul, yeah, he introduced this, this measure. And, and what, how does the left react? They, they remind him of that time that he got like punched by his neighbor or something. Yeah. You know, they're just unserious. You know, I hate to use that term because they use it so often, but, but really that's, the, that's how they are. They're not, they're not looking at these issues um, from, from the, from any kind of like strategy. It's just, it's just personality. This guy, uh, maybe he says something bad about trans people. Or, uh, you know, this guy doesn't, um, you know, they're, they're, they're conservatives. And so they can't be genuine uh, in, in any anti-war thing that they, that they put out. Well, it's like that song, though. they conservatives, so they can't be genuine, right? It's like the, the, the song we've been kind of dancing around. Because the, what is the reaction to this from, like, the liberal media? Well, I, I could have told you this the day that you sent me that song, Alex. You're, you know put that in a group chat, um, I could have laid out exactly what the media response was. Oh, this is somehow secretly racist. This is somehow secretly anti-Semitic because he's referencing a cabal of kind of elites. Therefore, it's, you know, and this is this is exactly what we got. You know, I, if you if you type in the song name on uh, Google News, you will just get the hit piece after hit piece going after. Yeah, this is the one. Is this the Philadelphia? Uh, this is Rolling Stone, oh, which yeah, is run by Noah Schachtman is their editor in chief. This is a guy who it's just straight up neocon who sold his, uh, you know, military fanboy blog to a weapons contractor and then went to work for Wired, which was started by John Negroponte's brother. And huh. then, uh, you know, neoconned his way into Rolling Stone after participating in the Aspen Institute, uh, war game simulation of the Hunter Biden laptop story dropping where they were instructed by national security spooks on how to convince other journalists not to report on the story. So he's the editor of Rolling Stone. Anyway, here's the but, but, headline. Well, 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 the, Rich the point Point of North of Richmond, a singing farmer in Virginia blasts high taxes and obese people on welfare and even appears to elude to Jeffrey Epstein, no. <laughs> the, the, the and you know, he looks like someone familiarity. that like he looks like someone that like bread tube hates. I mean, right. They just instantly don't like that guy. Well, so the new theory is that this guy is like a right wing plant. That he was somehow that he didn't even write the song. That it was like some big right wing production that was written for him and filmed for him, and it was artificially boosted through. But really what it, what, it, what they're basically admitting to when they come up with these insane theories is like, we can't wrap our heads around somebody other than us ha producing some cultural item that actually has mass appeal, right? So there has to be some nefarious explanation for why people are gravitating to this song that literally 
the main message, I've been selling my soul, working all day, overtime hours for bullshit pay. That's what people gravitate towards. And there's it's like this, it's, it's, it's just the, the dots do not connect. It's something there that is not clicking that you know, it, it, they're somehow unable to comprehend this as, um, you know, a genuine or organic reflection of what, what people are going through in, you know, quote unquote, flyover country. And I'll just, you know, I happen to be from one of these no good, desolate backwaters in Appalachia, um, tiny town called Elliston, Virginia, population 2000 uh, is where I grew up. A town that has been decimated, a town that has been destroyed, like basically every other small town in Appalachia um, from the opiate epidemic to offshoring. Uh, th there's just these towns have been systematically deprived of any employment prospects. And then the survivors got wiped out with this manufactured drug epidemic. Um, so people who are listening to these songs, they like want something, they need something to believe in, right? And instead, what they get from the media is emptiness, bullshit, the mainstream media. Actually, there was a there was this big current in media reports about the opioid, opioid epidemic, where a lot of these magazines, publications were basically blaming people here for it. And then there was this big current about um, because the MSM ignored the CIA sponsored crack epidemic in black neighborhoods, that this is like the just comeuppance that people here deserve to have this happen to, to us now. Um, but the reality is like people in Appalachia didn't do that. Uh, they did, right? <laughs> The, the the elites, the political elites and their media representatives. And in Appalachia, we have a very long tradition of just keeping to ourselves. And that goes beyond the way before the prohibition days. And that extends to the people of all races who have made their homes here. Um, and now finally, there's a song that speaks to that reality, uh, to the unbearable kind of desolation that people have been going through, that um, the the pain that translates into the increasing rates of social isolation, drug overdoses, suicides. Um, people here are suffering and that's what the song is about. And that's why it resonates so much. And it's incredible to watch all these like rad libs who've never worked a real job in their life, um, who've never seen the reality of one of these forgotten towns they suddenly crawl out of the woodwork to condemn this guy um and by extension everybody else who relates to it and um you know i, mean, I don't know we're talking about one of the most downtrodden communities and and regions in this country and um if they people aren't able to relate to that i think they should ask themselves why that is um because we yeah I don't, there's just something about this this American culture now. It's a culture of death. It's a culture of despair. Uh, that's what makes the song appealing is it is presenting an alternative. And you read through the comments on this video and people aren't talking about, um, you know, oh, the Jews and the blacks did this to us. They're talking about being fed up with a system that tells them to play by the rules, milks them dry their whole life and leaves them with nothing to show for it. Um, and they're talking about the joy and the relief that comes with knowing that other people are going through this too, and that they're not alone. Um, so I don't know. It's just, I never saw this as speaking against people. It's just, to me, it's like, you know, the, the people who are enjoying this song, they just want you to relate to. Um, that was all they wanted. And, and if you can't, sorry. Uh, but in the meantime, people are dying. And this is not some theoretical exercise that you just type away um you know so on behalf of Appalachia, i just want to say like get with it or get lost yeah I, I think uh if we didn't if we weren't going to possibly put this on pacifica you could put it on another way but you know we have to abide by fcc rules uh i mean it's just so funny to me that this song has become a cultural locator or political locator for the online right and the online left and there are right-wing influencers who have tried to depoliticize the song. Like, I don't have the Matt Walsh tweet 
but he basically said this song is just about the reason it's resonated with people because it's real there's just a guy with a beard and his guitar and he knows (laughs) what's going on that's not why it resonates with people uh and it's explicitly political and then on the left and it's it's the radlib kind of left the same people that you know called everyone an anti-vaxxer because they didn't want to shoot up with mrna uh, every few months for the rest of their lives and it is that they focus on just a few lines that are like clumsy uh the guy's talking about what he sees around him if you go out to small town usa you're going to see a lot of extremely obese unhealthy people who are on welfare who have nothing else like there's nothing else for them in their lives to do but to sit around watch tv drink smoke weed drinks big sodas there's they they too live kind of in a food desert and there's there's no productive economy around them because nafta and you know everything starting with reaganomics through nafta through uh you know what we're experiencing now bidenomics bidenomics i mean there's there's not there's no industrial base left for anyone and as you mentioned, why the opioid crisis was just a way of kind of killing off a surplus population through a uh, titanic marketing scheme. Uh, we can talk about that forever. Uh, but, uh, you know, to focus on a few clunky lines, when this guy, he's an amateur, is uh, just talking about what he sees around him. Kind of well, like uh, what you see, what you, what you heard in, in, in hip hop. Like and particularly gangster rap, it's just people were chronicling what they saw around them. So it wasn't going to be uh, the most sophisticated critique of the system. But most of the song, the bulk of the song, is about working extremely long hours for nothing, which is what anyone in the gig economy can relate to. And I think that's what resonates with people. Um, it's not uh, people who are five foot three and three hundred twenty pounds eating too many fudge rounds. Um, but you know, you know, even the the line because I I initially my first response to that was that I wasn't fond of it. I thought that there were bigger issues to go after than welfare. But even the line that comes directly after that expresses like a level of empathy that the left doesn't even have. He says, "Young men are putting themselves six feet in the ground because all this damn country does is keep kicking them down." That's that's immediately after the fudge rounds. So. You know, it, right. it shows that people are filling this this void of uh, alienation from their labor, of the breakdown of, you know, social structures and and, and families and, and and dealing with uh, drug addiction and poverty and all these other things in a in a media class that just doesn't give a damn about them, um, and and just like, you know, finding what little pleasures they can wherever they can. So I, I, mean, this, I do think that, go ahead. Well, this is, this is, I think from the AP it's reproduced in some local paper, new data reveals us suicide rates at all time high. Uh, CDC, this is CDC statistics, uh, 50,000, close to 50,000 people died by suicide in 2022. That's up by 3%. The largest increase in older adults, you know, men particularly, those are the guys who paid the price of NAFTA, the, the just having no industrial base, no community, all their communities dried up, uh, not being able to sort of participate in the digital world, uh, complete alienation. Uh, that's the population that was hit hardest by the opioid crisis because of, uh, you know, they experience pain and get, uh, you know, start taking anti-pain drugs and get into heroin. Uh, but there's also a youth mental health crisis. Pediatricians are reporting that youth are coming in with trauma and mental health issues at age five. I mean, what's, what's going on there? Like we saw the, the left freak out the, the, the official sort of respectable left freak out about, you know, different variants of COVID that had a 0.0001 fatality rate. And they, I, I don't see much of a discourse to borrow one of their terms about this reality and it's the reality that kind of plays out in this song of just people feeling worthless having no purpose in this country and uh being sucked into a really toxic culture uh so i just i just don't see the point in casting aside 
the meaning of this song. I mean, it's funny that we're even talking about it, but I don't even see the point in casting it aside because a few lines were, uh, you know, seen well, as punching down. You know, as, as you said, these these same people are, are the ones that basically mentally ruined an entire generation of young people. Um, ProPublica had an excellent story a few weeks ago. Uh, the decline in math scores for 13-year-olds between 2019 and 2020 in the 2022 to 2023 school year was the largest on record and the lowest performing students' reading scores were lower than they were for the first time since 1971. So, I mean, again, the left claims to care about poor people. Uh, so many young poor kids didn't have uh, the the parental, uh, the, 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 the environment at their own homes to engage with remote learning. And even the kids that did, of course, remote learning was not engaging for them. Um, and now you have this uh, this campaign to introduce AI into yeah. learning AI, which will you know uh, measure students' responsiveness to to their learning. And I mean, we're use we're going to be using students as uh, subjects for mass data collection uh, for you know behavioral uh, analysis and and, and uh, basically using them as uh, unconsenting guinea pigs. And this is the kind of thing that came out. So, I mean, we have this generation that's totally messed up uh, and, and, and the next generations are going to be exploited further with the tools that were created to solve that problem. And all of this was cheered on by the left. We said it was going to be happening and it's happening. And, and, you know, so it's the same people. Yeah. And uh, you know, I don't know what this, like this guy, Oliver Anthony came out of nowhere, sort of a amateur singer who's now going to probably get some deal. And, you know, you can imagine uh, Republican linked elements are going to do what they can to kind of promote and co-opt him. Uh, he may not be co-optable, but uh, I'm looking for the tweet. I can't find it, but uh, Midwestern Marx is going to host him and interview him. Uh, and it would be interesting to hear his perspective because my understanding based on what I've seen, uh, from him is that he doesn't really support either political faction in this country, either major political faction. So it'd be interesting right. to hear what he has to say about the whole thing. It just seems like you can't cap, I mean, um, capitalism co-opts all critiques. And so to the yeah. extent he's co-opted by the, the consultants of the right that consultant class of the right that is capitalism co-opting and basically defanging his critique, which I think is a, I mean, at, at its, at its core, it is an anti-capitalist critique, even if it is flawed. Yeah. And he yeah. represents kind of the best tradition of, of this Appalachian singer songwriter that's had like a resurgence over the past 10 years. And it's not a coincidence that this comes along with this insane uptick in suffering people here, like when that happens, we like write music about it. And, um, you know, it's kind of this Tyler Childers sort of tradition, but there are, there are a thousand guys singing like him um, who are just incredibly talented and have a lot to say um, and are able to make music that, you know, if you give it a listen, it really resonates. And it's not, it's not coming from a place of hate. It's coming from uh, a place of trying to relate. What, what you have out there, you have, you would think you would have the social ingredients for some revolutionary ferment in this country, just with the amount of despair and anger that's out there. And, and, and I, I feel it. I see it in my everyday. I hear it in my conversations with people every day. Um, but there are so many layers of suppression of that impulse on uh, one layer of that suppression is just the cynicism that's piled on on social media. Uh, the cynicism that comes from the sort of credentialed, educated left and the, uh, the exploitative quality of the right to take a song like this and just turn it into some pathetic political vehicle for Ron DeSantis or whatever they want to do with it. Um, and I mean, and, and then you have another element, other elements. I mean, social media itself, it just keeps people at home. I saw the lockdowns as the ultimate uh, distillation of the program to keep people at home, to keep them out of the streets and to force them into this kind of 
world of an AI and Oculus smoking metaverse, smoking high powered legalized weed all the time. And I mean, you know, other psychedelics are legal now, uh, prescription drugs, just living in a drugged out metaverse for the rest of their lives to keep them from actually challenging the system that is, that is so ups- obviously upset them. And, uh, you know, it's just pathetic. Yeah. It's, it's brave new world. It's it brave new world is a much better critique than 1984 of right. what we're living through. I always thought Huxley had it right. Uh, but it's just pathetic to see all the cool leftist influencers play the role that they, that they played throughout the pandemic of just pissing on people who are out in the streets protesting the one of the biggest psyops of our lives. So I don't know if there's anything to add to, to that, but, uh, well, you know, I just, you know, final thought on Oliver Anthony is that, uh, you know, anyone who's, who's critiquing the uniparty and the elites, you know, let's not instantly condemn them. You know, let's see, yeah. let's, let's give the guy a listen, you know, because, uh, I mean, I, I always say this about the 2016 presidential election. People say, oh, well, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. Actually, the couch won the popular vote because more people stayed at home than voted for her. So, you know, if let's, you know, encourage this kind of uh, distrust of the Uniparty and the, the one that wants to, instead of uh, investing in health programs and, and, and reducing this obesity epidemic and drug epidemic and so on, just wants to keep sending uh, more weapons to Nazis in Ukraine. Um, so, you know, let's, let's give the guy a listen. Yeah. Uh, and thank you to all of you who've contributed to our fundraiser to create dedicated positions for Wyatt and Alex. Uh, I just threw the link back in the chat. Uh, we're getting close to 70, 70 K that's for Wyatt, Alex and kit, uh, to have dedicated positions. So, I mean, we just hit it. We just hit 70. Beautiful. Thank you to everyone who's come through. I mean, all it's all going to them to give them uh, full time jobs or whatever, <laughs> whatever we can do um, to send them to report from the field, uh, to have them work as Kit has been doing with leaked classified documents that no one else will touch. I think continuing the legacy of WikiLeaks. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it real. I mean, if we can depend on our audience and not like one guy with an agenda, like so many other, uh, sites, including, uh, self-styled anti-war sites, then we're going to be able to just answer to you and be ourselves. I mean, we'll, we'll be ourselves anyway. Uh, you know, that's what, yeah, that, that won't stop, but Look at the impact that we've made with all the groundbreaking reports that we've had since this war. I mean, I think that our journalism has been the most hard hitting of any outlet with a fraction of the budget, a fraction of the staff just running on a shoestring. So, you know, I, I, I have always believed in the gray zone and, you know, uh, the more that we can, uh, you know, grease it and turn it into a machine, um, you know, the, the better this world's going to be. So, you know, I, I want to thank everyone that's donated for that. Well, thanks. And uh, we'll continue the conversation. Uh, do you want to talk about Niger or, you know, we have, and we, we do not have a mandatory beard <laughs> policy. I think <laughs> we I had a shave. mandatory <laughs> Jew policy and then kid came along. So we just have a <laughs> mandatory, like, <clears throat> We have a mandatory white guy policy. No, I don't know. I, mean, I think our, our roster of contributors is pretty diverse. And we have uh, Anya doesn't have a beard. And many of our contributors don't have beards or clean shaven and uh, have more melanin than we do. Um, someone mentioned Sixto Rodriguez dying. That's mm. uh, Sugar Man. Who did this song that was he, he he's his career failed in the US and he made it in apartheid South Africa among uh anti-apartheid whites. And I never could get the appeal of that song. Uh, <laughs> I just don't it starts with I wonder have you it's like I wonder have you ever given head? And I wonder 
uh, how many times you've had sex. And then I wonder who's going to be next. I mean, read the lyrics to that song. It's like, it's so random, but somehow that spoke to a generation of anti-apartheid Afrikaner youth. Uh, maybe it's just like the vibe of the song, but they must have been really the, culturally. The first, the first time I heard that song, I was like, damn, this is the worst Bob Dylan song I've ever heard. <laughs> Yeah, it's like uh it's like if Dylan's motorcycle crash was even worse, that's what it but I mean there's some pretty bad Dylan songs post motorcycle crash, but he made a Christmas album, do you remember? Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah he's, he's no he's no Roger Waters. Waters. He got into uh Christianity because he was traveling around with uh his his backup singers were a black uh, Baptist who'd been raised in the south, so he started praying with them backstage but this was again after he suffered a traumatic accident and uh and then he did nashville skyline with johnny cash and it got a one-star review in rolling stone i think this was like and his voice had changed he started having a voice kind of like that i thought that was like one of his only good post crash albums but rolling stone destroyed it and so like he you know fell into crisis Oh man, um, back when Rolling Stone still had any impact at all. Yeah, I remember when it mattered. Board. Yeah. <laughs> remember Newsweek? Yeah. <laughs> it's like time, you know? Time. Oh, the yeah, CIA time. used to have have like a dependable outlet in time. They could just put send them anything and Henry Luce would just crank that right out. But nowadays, I mean nobody reads it, so what's the point? Yeah, time uh they make Hitler man of the year. <laughs> Find yeah, that. them and Hands between them and the New York Times, like uh, single-handedly rehabilitating the image of Adolf Hitler for American audiences. It was, yeah. Uh, this is sort of a preview of uh, that. Did they make Zelensky Man of the Year? Do they still do Person yeah. of the Year, or was Person yeah. of the Year like Greta Thunberg? I thought they did it with Zelensky. I thought they gave him. It was right after his Vogue cover. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I found something. Incredible. They did make Greta Thunberg was the 2019 person of the year. Wait, here's a, here's a fact check on uh, was Hitler actually man of the year? Fact check. Time magazine did not praise Hitler with 1938 <laughs> man of the year. Like, what is the point of this fact check? <laughs> oh, I see what the point is. The claim Hitler selection as time man of the year shows why the media is quote, not your friend. No, the media is still your friend. Uh, we, the mainstream media is good. They didn't praise Hitler. So that's the mm. point of fact checkers is sort of to maintain so, uh, whatever consent. Is I, left. I'm yeah. remembering the, uh, the cover that they did for Zelensky's man of the year award. If you pull up the picture, you can see on the right of his shoulder, uh, a woman there who she's actually very famous in Ukraine and she was the subject. Well, she wasn't the oh, subject, right, but right, she, right, right. she was in one of our articles because I did this article where I uh, spent about a week watching um, Ukrainians with missing limbs uh, participate against like totally jacked, uh, <laughs> you know, veterans in a, a series of sporting events held at Disney World, uh, keynoted by Jon Stewart. And she was one of the one of the people that one of the main figures in the Ukrainian team. Um, and she used to she used to be with right sector and she's actually been quoted, uh, you you're never former right sector, you're always right sector or something to that effect. Um, so you know, there you go, a Nazi on the cover with with uh Zelensky in his Time magazine photo. Or, or, so, or photo art. Zelensky actually shared the person of the year honor last year with uh, the spirit of Ukraine, which represents the resilience of the Ukrainian people and oh, the Ukrainian right, resistance, right, right. as well as foreign aid to Ukraine. So that was you at home, NAFO Brigade. That one was for you too. The spirit of Ukraine is not a person. It's like, do, do they have like vibe of the year? Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, to quote uh, the great Russian expert, Terrell Starr, right sector in the house. <laughs> <laughs> That's an old one. Yeah. 
That was that was when that was when we were the only ones talking that knew what right sector was. Right yeah. sector into his house. Yeah, people were like, "You've fallen down the rabbit hole way too far." You're talking about this as of stuff. Yeah. And, and just what a, yeah. what a corny thing to say in the house. Like. <laughs> yeah, da duh. In the house. Oh man, I forgot to pull this. I think up it was his there. house, though. You know. Right. I forgot to pull this up during the Oliver Anthony uh, se section, but I just wanted to make one point, which is the the cool left influencers. They all like Beyonce. The self proclaimed right. she 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 refers to herself as the Black Bill Gates, like she right. is one of the most insidious promoters of neoliberal capitalism. I just and I just remember Amy Goodman did a tribute to Beyonce back in <laughs> oh 2016. God. Yeah, I wanted I wanted to play the, the audio. I don't know if it's here, but it's hilarious. Um, but yeah, I mean, well, yeah. a big problem with with not just hip hop but pop music in general is like that's the only thing that's glorified. It's getting rich and famous and being like a billionaire, right? So so songs that are not about that, not that are for people who don't aspire to become wealthy and famous jet setting elites like it's of course it doesn't relate either and yeah. and you know so i don't i don't understand how so many of these people can can make exceptions for the rest of pop music and for the rest of these just in many cases extremely vapid or just outright exactly. bad people um but then this guy all of a sudden you know because he like the YouTube video about dancing Israelis. He's like, you know, the second coming <laughs> of right. Hitler. Well, he, it, and the video is just the ABC news report. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's, yeah. you know, it's, I mean, the, like, there were, yeah. there were, uh, there's a, there's a debate about what the purpose of the Israelis were, but they were there with a moving van and they were seen dancing while looking at the towers burn, but there's a debate about the significance of it. And they right. had stacks of money in there and like ABC news reported on it, like Brian Ross is investigated. So of course it's a stretch to call him an anti-Semite. I mean, when, once you start doing that, that's when you know that uh, they're out to get him. They're out to destroy this guy. Well, I had a great response, and I, I'm sorry I can't credit the X user that posted it because I, I haven't been able to find it since, but somebody replied to me under my uh, article about uh, Zelensky meeting with this raging anti-Semite militant, um, Andre Beletsky, and they said, well, at least Jeremy Corbyn wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that would have been a huge scandal. We should we should Photoshop Jeremy Corbyn meeting with Zelensky if we really want to take <laughs> Zelensky down among the Western elites because he, he he's not allowed to meet with an anti racist who sees Palestinians as uh, remotely human. Um, moving on though, we're on the precipice still, I think, of what could be another proxy war in Sahelian Africa. Uh, the war would be led by Nigeria, which is a country that since the 1990s, the U.S. has been transforming into a kind of proxy, a military proxy, um, at least ostensibly to fight uh, insurgent elements, Boko Haram and so on, training them in special forces. But, but it's really just a, uh, it, it's to gain a toehold in a resource rich area where we know uh, that the um, leader of the, um, the tribal uh, activist and environmental activist, Ken Sarawia, was executed, killed for challenging Chevron's exploitative practices. Um, and he, uh, Nigeria is currently led by one of the most suspect figures on the African continent, who is a key U.S. ally. And Alex, you had a piece uh, with Kit. I wish Kit was still here. That was represented one of our most viral pieces in recent time. It went viral in Nigeria because it was, fin you know, finally 
someone was spelling out in a foreign publication, a US based publication, what their reality has been under the presidency of someone who goes by the name Bola Tinubu, but whose real name remains unknown and who was reportedly money laundering, or not reportedly, according to court documents, was laundering money for a massive heroin smuggling operation in the 1990s. And this would be the leader of the coalition against Niger, which just had a clearly popular coup with 73% of Nigerian citizens, not Nigerian, but citizens of Niger, supporting the military junta that is seeking to kick out the French and gain some control over their natural resources, including the uranium that France uses to power its economy, which has not uh, fueled any relief from the massive poverty that Niger has experienced. 73%, according to a poll reported in The Economist. And this complements the popular coups that have been witnessed in Bamako, in Mali, in Ouagadougou, in Burkina Faso, in which citizens have been seen waving Russian flags in the street in support of those military juntas that have came come, that have removed uh, Western-backed technocratic figures who are just seen as completely corrupt. Uh, Mohamed Bazoum, the ousted leader of Niger, who supposedly won an election, but it looks like kind of a phony election or very contested election, uh, is now facing prosecution, possibly because he has sought to collaborate to trigger an intervention presided over by France. But again, at the center of this all is the Nigerian leader, Bola Tinubu, who you wrote about, Alex, in this piece, from Chi-Town Bagman to ECOWAS chairman, meet the former money launderer leading the push to invade Niger. Uh, so tell us about the Niger Bola Tinubu, the Nigerian president, and why he's significant here, and where are we at uh, with the possibility of an ECOWAS intervention or invasion? It looks like many of the ECOWAS states are breaking ranks, and and the Nigerian parliament is not into it either. Yeah, and and, and on top of that, the African Union is also not into it. Not that they're binding and and or able to like somehow veto an ECOWAS intervention, but. Uh, you know, the and the problem for Bola Taniba right now is also that, you know, he's he's also in a disputed election. Um, he's a very unpopular person in Nigeria. He's been for the past 30 years one of the most influential people in Nigerian politics. Um, he's gotten nicknames such as Mother of the Market. So he's a very wealthy man. Uh, the German state, the, we're, these aren't conspiracy theories, the German state broadcaster. DW has said the source of his wealth is unknown. Well, there may be some hints offered in these court documents from Illinois uh, that identified Bola Tinibu as the bag man for a Chicago heroin gang. Um, somehow, uh, Bola Tinibu was never indicted. He was allowed to leave the United States while, uh, while this investigation was happening. Um, and initially, uh, uh, there was more than a million dollars, which are just for inflation is even more than that, um, that was seized from his bank accounts. And somehow it turned out that he was able to keep a good portion of that. So anyways, he leaves the United States, goes to Nigeria and uh, starts, you know, um, his political career first in the Nigerian Senate, then as the governor of Lagos, uh, which is a major port city and one of the main economic centers of the country. Um, and, and, you know, basically, uh, run, he, you know, head of a political party, uh, there was one quote, uh, from, I believe it was Reuters, uh, correct me if I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but, uh, some official news organization that said that every candidate that he had backed has always won. Um, so, I mean, unbelievable levels of corruption in Nigeria. There was an incident where two armored vehicles uh, showed up at his house filled with cash. And he basically said, uh, you know, in the, during the 2019 presidential, I, I'm sorry, just the 2019 elections. And uh, it was widely speculated by Nigerians that he was using that money to buy votes. 
Um, so he basically said, well, if I want to give money to the public, I can do it. And, you know, I put my money wherever I want. Um, later on, it was claimed that, uh, that, uh, the armored vehicles filled with cash had showed up at his residence by act by accident, um, which was, uh, hilarious. And, and that was, uh, spotted by why it went to the wrong address. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you have this deeply corrupt guy when that you know, happens. I hate it when armored trucks filled with millions of dollars show up at my house. <laughs> so annoying but, uh, all the time. You know, and throughout his political career, he was he was collaborating deeply with the U.S. Embassy. Uh, dozens of uh, State Department cables uh, leaked cables by uh, cables leaked by WikiLeaks um, detailing his conversations with the embassy. I don't know if. Uh, you guys still have me. The connection seems kind of bad, but no, you're um, there. good. Okay, great. Here's, yeah, here, and, he is with, and, here he is with Macron. I like the one where they're holding hands and uh, Bridget looks like kind of jealous. Yeah, that's yeah, the one. That's the one. <laughs> I don't know. It's the, it's like the distracted boyfriend meme, you know? Her face might be frozen <laughs> that way. I'm not sure. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, he became he became a, a you know a trusted U.S. asset, and you know they have all this leverage on him, um, and you and you know that uh, he's he's doing their bidding. He's besties with Macron and doing the bidding of the United States in in uh, saber rattling against Niger, and you know I I, I like to think of him uh, similar to a, another uh, foreign leader that has also <laughs> had some. Uh, run-ins with uh u.s law for drug trafficking law enforcement you know um uh, the the former president of honduras juan orlando hernandez who you know was an ally of the u.s for the first four years of his presidency and the uh second four illegal four years of his presidency um and basically as soon as he was out of office the u.s sent out an extradition warrant uh, for him. And so now he's, he's in prison. So this is, I mean, this is like key for the United States is to have leverage on these, um, these kinds of people who, who can be exploited towards whatever end, uh, whatever serves the objectives of the state department or, or the Pentagon. And then as soon as they're no longer useful can be disposed of. So, you know, I, I tend to think of Bola Tanibu in that term, as far as where yeah. ECOWAS is, I think that ECOWAS is, uh, <laughs> shown itself to be like the worst paper tiger ever uh yeah. first they gave a one week uh ultimatum about restoring the president saying that if it wasn't done then then they would intervene they have not intervened that was like a week ago now that that deadline passed uh they're still meeting today in Accra. i think go ahead wyatt well they've announced this came out about an hour ago they they said that they have decided on quote a d-day for an invasion of niger the uh, the uh, commissioner, the ECOWAS commissioner for political affairs, peace and security uh, said, we are ready to go anytime the order is given. The D-Day is also decided. Um, as we speak, we're still readying a mediation mission to the country, so we have not shut any door. Uh, so they are basically continuing these threats, uh, very overt, very violent militaristic threats. Uh, to go in and root out this popular uh, government by force uh, against the wishes of the domestic population. And this comes obviously even after the African Union uh, Political uh, Security Council, I believe, uh, voted against this uh, and rejected uh, any efforts to launch an armed military intervention um, to quote unquote restore democracy. Obviously, the subtext here is uh, the U.S., France does not give a damn about democracy in Africa. They never have. Um, at, you know, at, at some point between when the CIA was, you know, had an operative driving around with Patrice Lumumba's body in the trunk of the car, um, you know, 50 years ago, and some point today, we're meant to believe that all of a sudden the the U.S. elites had a change of heart, I guess, and now we genuinely, you know, we just really care about democracy. We didn't care about it, obviously, when we forced out Imran Khan from Pakistan. Um, but today, this week, we really care about democracy. Um, and, you know, it's just the, the, the double standards, the, the double speak, you know, 
it's really incredible. I, I, I struggle to think of a moment in time when it's been this crystal clear. Yeah. Well, we, we, and, and I think that, you know, people in Western countries, anti-war people really need to uh, prepare for uh, the coming influx of condemnations and warnings about, you know, the presence of Wagner in, in the region and, and the uh, malign influence of Russia and China and why, you know, could, because they're going to be prepared to push back against whatever arguments we may have for the self-determination of people in Niger and Burkina Faso and Mali and Guinea uh, with these, you know, kind of uh, insinuations about, about Wagner. Um, what's at risk here is actually, in my view, much more dangerous than what has been at risk with Ukraine in a lot of ways, because with Ukraine, Russia understood that it could not pass certain borders. It was very carefully contained and they didn't go in with shock and awe. You know, th th this is Africa. Th there, there won't be those rules. There's no NATO border and you have a handful of countries that are, have relationships with Russia and China, and you have other countries that have relationships with the West. So it, what's, what's at state, what, what, what's possible here is a region wide proxy war. And so when I say region wide, I mean like the entire West African region, uh, you have to think of this in terms of the potential for another Iraq rather than another Ukraine, I think. And if you look at who the U S sent to Niger, to negotiate, it was Victoria Newland. Who's Victoria Newland's husband? Kagan. Well, I want to I want to take a little a slightly more nuanced view of that. Uh, Victoria Newland actually went. Uh, she's now I think Deputy Secretary of State, so she's the number two. Uh, when she was Assistant Secretary, she actually went to Brazil, and I said, "Oh, here comes the angel of death in the election uh, between Bolsonaro, pitting Bolsonaro against Lula da Silva." But if you paid close attention, she was sort of threatening Bolsonaro against claiming that he lost. Um, you know, they they saw a very tight election and they saw possibly another January 6th moment, um, social unrest. But it seemed like uh, there was a possibility that the State Department actually preferred Lula over Bolsonaro there. Uh, he was he could see, be seen as someone who could be reined in um, a regional power broker who the U S could work through versus uh, someone like Bolsonaro, who's deeply invested in Trumpism and close to Steve Bannon. Uh, so she may not have been playing the role that we initially thought. And now we have France actually attacking the U S openly over refusing to join it in ferociously condemning and delegitimizing the junta in Niger. Well, they haven't called it a coup yet. They haven't they called. Call it okay, so the U.S. has a drone base in Niger. It right. wants to main. That's its priority. It wants right. to maintain operations. So it's, it's possible that Newland went there to just try to work with the junta. Say, look, we'll talk to you. You just gotta do some new elections or get some technocrat in there. But we just want to keep our basing operations. Whereas France wants to control the entire country because it's so dependent on this this Sahelian region of Africa for its natural resources that it has been exploiting for so long. We think of the Libyan intervention as a U.S.-led uh, regime change war. It was really a French-led regime change war that Hillary Clinton signed on to after she, as a, as a sinister dupe, was recruited by Bernard-Henri Lévy on behalf of Sarkozy. And Sarkozy himself was in many ways recruited by Qatar, he was being paid through uh, you know, French football clubs that, that Qatar had bought. And there were various means in which he was being influenced, influenced. But France clearly wanted Libya's gold reserves. France wanted to get its tentacles into Libya. So France had to recruit the U.S. into that to, to get its war. And what has happened since the Libyan intervention is, is something that no one disputes. The Council on Foreign Relations has articles on it. The destabilization of that entire region of Africa, which is the context for these popular coups, where the, the arms depots of the Libyan military were opened up, placed in the hands of jihadist elements that had been emboldened and even backed 
by NATO. And then they went across borders, as they could have been predicted to do, into northern Mali, uh, formed groups like Boko Haram. These are areas, heavily Muslim areas that are impoverished. The communities are neglected. They're very uh, you know, fertile soil for the recruitment of Al-Qaeda-related groups. And then they started staging attacks on urban areas and on the militaries of these countries, starting in northern Mali. And Mali was, of course, the first country that said enough uh, citizens in Bamako actually started organizing after this happened. This is France 24. French state media is openly calling out Qatar for sponsoring jihadist elements in northern Mali, uh, sponsoring al-Qaeda. French members of parliament had been complaining about it. And France was basically, they, I mean, they did their little uh, intervention in Timbuktu, but they didn't stop it. They did not protect the people of Mali. And so the people of Mali actually prepared a petition. Um, a million people signed it. A group, uh, a grassroots group called Patriots for Mali organized a petition after this, you know, the, the terrorism wave calling on Russia to send in its forces or the Wagner group to defend them because France was not doing so. And they hated France in general because they were had historically been exploiting them. So Mali now has a popular gover anti-French government. Next, Burkina Faso, for the same reason. And then we have Niger, and they all were plagued by Al-Qaeda attacks that have been brought on by the Libyan intervention, which was an initiative of France and Qatar uh, with the U.S. signing on and providing the military muscle and the NATO uh, backing. So draw a straight line from Libya 2011 to Niger today. Uh, the U.S. has to see the writing on the wall. And they have screwed France before. Remember the uh, AUKUS deal for mm. submarines, nuclear-powered submarines to Australia? Well, the U.S. came in after Canberra had signed a deal to buy 80 diesel-powered subs from France and got them to stab... And, and they just stabbed France in the back. And the U.S. wants to keep France weak for other reasons. Uh, France has shown itself to be the more independent force in Europe, whereas Germany uh, under Schultz has gone along with everything the U.S. and NATO want it to do in Ukraine, even as it destroys its own economy. But France is seeking to maintain some diplomatic space and independence. Uh, Macron has always said we need to support Ukraine, but we can't destroy Russia. We shouldn't bring Putin down. And he's maintained the line to Putin. So there are all these elements there that I think we have to consider when we think about the what the U.S. and France want in Niger and in this uh, whole cluster of countries that have popular coup governments. And I think they're different. Yeah. Well, and it's there's irony, obviously, in France. French state media pointing out Qatar's financing terrorism. They're all financing terrorism, especially in Africa, especially in that region. I mean, this this got totally brushed over in the West, but there was a, a cement factory, a French-owned cement factory, um, that ultimately the company's owners were forced to hand yep. over millions of dollars because they, they were um, paying ISIS and collaborating with ISIS. Yeah. Um, certain investigations have indicated that that was actually a cover for French secret services. Um, and there's been a number of reports in Turkish media, interestingly enough, um, drawing very direct links between Turk, between French intelligence and ISIS, um, through this, through this cement factory. All of these, all of these countries were using different, have, have, and I imagine to this day are continuing to employ certain, uh, terrorist forces. Um, you know, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. And we certainly, uh, that became very clear uh, through Operation Cyclone for the United States that, um, you know, we're training and financing people like Osama bin Laden. And lo and behold, um, turns out, you know, terrorists continue to be terrorists even after you stop paying them. It definitely. And and I think there's there's more to learn about interactions between France and other uh, ostensible U.S. allies and the jihadist forces that have been plaguing Sahelian Africa uh, that aren't 
easily Googleable, uh, but people on the ground know that they're there. They see France as, uh, you know, not just a colonizer, but as an enabler of the people who are r rampaging through their communities. And so who else can they turn to but the adversary of France and the U.S., Russia? And so you have um, people making loads of money in capital cities in Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger by doing embroidery of Russian flags. These are handmade Russian flags that people are waving in the street. So, and so for, for Russia and the Kremlin, this is a major public relations coup because it's showing Africans do not want business as usual. And business as usual means the US, France, the NATO allies continuing to exploit them. The question is, um, what character will these juntas take on? Will they appoint technocrats uh, to at least provide a political face to their leadership? Will they embrace a redistributive policy? Will they actually take the resources and use the profits to fund social programs and education as the citizens of these countries hope for? We, have, we really have no idea. Uh, but we, there could be a, a new dawn in Africa, and this flows straight into uh, BRICS. And by the way, I should say that uh, I got to be in the same space as the Prime Minister of Burkina Faso, uh, who is a student of Thomas Sankara, uh, the revolutionary reformer of Burkina Faso, who really brought uh, so many of those countries' citizens out of poverty provided them with literacy, and in his final speech before he was killed, warned Africa of the debt trap of the IMF, told African leaders, just don't pay your debt, just tell them to go to hell. He was killed soon after that speech. The prime minister of Burkina Faso was invited to the January, July 19th celebration of the liberation of Nicaragua by the Sandinistas from the dictator Anastasio Somoza that I was present at this July in Managua, uh, and he was invited there to rekindle the ties that Thomas Sankara started with the Sandinista government in the 1980s of Nicaragua. He had met with Daniel Ortega, who was himself on hand as the Nicaraguan president. So that was, uh, I mean, that uh, really speaks to the international importance of these popular coup governments not just with respect to Russia, but to the whole uh, global South and the developing world that will be present uh, bricks. And so many of these countries are going to be applying for membership. Well, even if Ibrahim Traore is not um, Thomas Sankara, like he would have to try pretty hard to be worse than the other guys, right? Yeah. That's kind of the, that's the, that's the sentiment that I get from, and I think that explains the popularity of the junta in Niger. Like, even if they're terrible, they still would have to, they still probably can't be as bad as the last guys, right? I think that's that's kind of the popular sentiment. Yeah, I mean, what did the last guys do? I mean, it's, they had no anti-poverty program. Their entire existence was predicated on uh, providing uh, foreign investors with uh, a safe space. And everybody knows right. that. Right. Bazoum, I mean, w w his trial will be very interesting. If he goes on trial in Niger, his trial will be very, it'll bring all of this out into the public, what he, right. what kind of deals he cut with France, but also what he has been doing since being deposed or those around him to trigger an intervention, which could lead, as Alex said, into an Iraq style situation, or at least a Libya level destabilization. Well, I, I meant Iraq in the sense that, you know, it went from Iraq into other countries, right? And so it, it became a region-wide destabilizing force. It wasn't contained in the way that the Ukraine conflict has been contained. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it would destabilize governments across West Africa. And you see what's happening in Senegal. I mean, who, what, who, who are they? Who is that government? to wag the finger at Niger when they are openly arresting and jailing their opposition. There's, they have nothing to say. Uh, 
Chad yeah, miss, said it's not going to be. Yeah, I misread the the Senegalese president Macky Sall because he was for a while operating as the president of the African Union, um, and so uh, I I kind of interpreted the unwillingness of the African Union to get drawn into what they see correctly, I think, as a proxy war between Russia and the United States. And from that, I kind of, I, there was a part of me that, that didn't understand that he's still just this total collaborator or sellout, and that's how he's seen by, and I actually had to, I, I spoke extensively with one of my friends who's Senegalese, who um, moved back uh, from Senegal uh, last year, and he really set me straight in, in terms of just how unpopular Macky Sall is in terms uh, internally in Senegal um, and the real popular support that the opposition does have. There was a part of me that 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 thought this perhaps was some kind of, um, because it's so difficult to trust Western reporting on the African continent specifically. Um, you just really never under, know who's motivating what, what the motivations of the writers are. Um, and, you know, he was describing a legitimate grassroots uh, resistance to the Saul government um, and apparently the only way that they could see to uh, overcome this was to jail the opposition for three years. They banned him from participating in politics for the next five years. Uh, they shut down the Internet completely. Uh, just things. It doesn't get more authoritarian than that. But all of these things being done ostensibly in the name of democracy, right? Yeah. Well, you had an Ivory Coast a uh, couple months ago, four people, four protesters arrested for the crime of waving Russian flags. So, you know, they say that they want it. These, these countries where they have these protesting le uh, pro-Western leaders, they, they say that they want to emulate the United States. They want to uh, be like us, be like Western democracies, not like, not like the, you know, dictatorships of Russia and China. Uh, but then they go and they do, you know, things that are just totally contrary to the uh, ideals espoused by by France and, and and by the United States and, you know, the democracy where uh, speech, including holding a Russian flag is uh, grounds for imprisonment. Yeah, uh, which they do in, in Germany. So uh, I, I, I can't see. I can't see anything going forward. Uh, being led by ECOWAS, any invasion going forward being led by, it's going to have to be led by France somehow. They're going to have to create some kind of pretext. Well, you had you had in the Atlantic Council, uh, yeah, that's a good point about creating a, a pretext, but you had the former French ambassador to the UN in the Atlantic Council, NATO's de facto think tank, uh, lamenting that uh, the coup was successful because France did not intervene in the first hour. So basically he wanted his country to immediately go to war. I think ECOWAS has a real problem here because they're not getting support from uh, the African Union. And not only that, but like NATO uh, stocks are not exactly at, you know, full capacity at the moment. So it'll be tricky to uh, finesse um, th that a two, you know, a proxy war on two fronts. I will say the 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 deployment of troops from what I'm hearing and from the uh, report I think we referenced earlier, David Hundayan, uh, he indicates that despite the Nigerian Senate uh, refusing to authorize uh, military action, that basically the Tinubu administration is going ahead and redeploying military assets anyway. Um, I think it's kind of like the United States in that fundamentally the presidency is just unreasonably powerful and doesn't really need authorization from the legislature to do something like that. Um, they can just kind of declare some kind of national security uh, crisis and uh, deploy troops on their own. Um, and that seems to be, uh, who knows if it's all just smoke and mirrors or some kind of deception. Um, but from what he's reported, there have been uh, troop movements to the level that would indicate that uh, it's certainly still in the cards, an actual uh, an intervention uh, through Nigeria, which, of course, would be the main uh, fighting force in any invasion of Niger. It's the uh, shares a border, obviously. It's the only uh, country that would be fighting that does share a border with 
Niger. Um, and it's also obviously the richest by far in the region, um, has by far the most uh, military resources. So Nigeria is kind of the main player in all this. And I think as they go, so the rest of the region will likely follow rather the pro Western states in the region are likely to follow. And, and, you know, if you want background on Nigeria's military and how the U S and UK have prepared it for this invasion, we have a long analysis by TJ Coles, who is an expert on UK and U S uh, neo-colonialism in Africa on our site, just, uh, just, just, uh, search Nigeria or Africa in the search bar at the gray zone. Um, but that's, you know, the kind of background we're always able to provide, um, switching. I want to cover one more thing before we go quickly, which is, uh, I guess two in one Pakistan and the Trump indictments. Cause I see them, uh, kind of in the same light. Uh, this is a, there's a new uh, community note on a tweet by Secretary of State Tony Blinken, who congratulated Anwar Kakar, the new interim Prime Minister of Pakistan, on uh, you know preparing for free and fair elections in accordance with its constitution and the rights to freedom of speech and assembly. Just a ridiculous tweet. Uh, considering the context which readers have provided, which is the State Department under Blinken on March 7th, 2022, encouraged the removal of Pakistan's previously democratically elected prime minister, extremely popular prime minister, Imran Khan, who was opposed to U.S. drone bases and was the most independent-minded leader in recent Pakistani memory. He was removed from power and arrested in an obvious lawfare campaign. And here is a, a, an exchange between Jalal Afridi, who is managing editor of the National Post, and uh, Sec State Department spokesman, I think it's Matthew Miller, just uh, two weeks before the cable showing the State Department's role in Imran Khan's ouster was exposed in the intercept. Is the responsibility going on President Biden wanting to change the regime in Pakistan? Or the secretary. I mean, one he's asking about regime secretary. change in the State uh, Department. I feel like I need to bring uh, just a sign that I can hold up in response to this question to so say smug. that that, that <laughs> allegation is not true. I don't know how many times I can say it. I will say, as I've said before, <laughs> that does not have a position on one political candidate or party versus another in Pakistan or in any other country. What a complete that's an incredible lie. statement. Like you yeah. think that's you know I'm sure the people of Nicaragua right? Cuba, Venezuela, um, obviously even, even Brazil. Uh, I mean, the, it's, the U S has an interest in every country's elections. They, they have, yeah. there's no election that they will leave alone. And, and honestly, one of the worst parts of that to me is like the little smug chuckles from the rest of the reporters in the press pool there, just like, yeah. ha ha ha. Oh, he, he got him. And, and it's yeah. just, why would you, just that is the opposite of what a journalist is supposed to be and supposed to do. You're supposed to be there to treat them with skepticism and push back on their claims. And instead they just, you know, they really showed their hand. They just want to be like them. You know, they want to be invited to the same parties and most likely they probably are. Right. And so well, they, the they don't want to have any problems at the white house correspondence dinner, you know, yeah, any I mean, awkward just moments. From what I know, I mean, we have Liam Cosgrove going to State Department and Pentagon briefings is that uh, all, most of the, what the reporters do is either ask questions as sort of uh, de facto representatives of their governments because they're foreign correspondents or they're just uh, they're just complete tools and they keep getting called on because they're tools and that helps them build up their own career within whatever news agency they're in or within just the general Beltway press corps. And Liam, you know, he's one of the few critical reporters in there in the tradition of Helen Thomas in the briefing room. And at the same time, he's not working for a major agency. So, you know, they could just not call on him. Uh, so you need, you do need to maintain a relationship with the spokesman and you can't, uh, but, but this is a, a case where- antagonize them. Well, uh, they very, they're, they're very thin skinned. They're, and they're right. complete liars and they they can de determine who they call on. 
I would like uh, to get the gray zone in the briefing room this week uh, to talk about, to, to ask about Pakistan now that Matthew Miller has been exposed as a liar. I mean, and I don't want to even call him a liar because he probably doesn't even know. I mean, right. the, the last person to know is the spokesman, the flat. Okay. Um, so anyway, that is what's happened in Pakistan. Imran Khan has just uh, been uh, destroyed in a lawfare campaign by a U.S. backed opposition for obvious reasons. We saw in Ecuador after Lenin Moreno, the turncoat came into power. He started to, he went, he immediately pursued his former comrade, Rafael Correa and Jorge Glass, uh, jailed Jorge Glass. Rafael Correa had to go into exile. Uh, we see what's happening in Brazil today. Uh, the Lula da Silva administration is going after Bolsonaro. Um, we have, and they went after Lula as well. You know, they went after Lula as well. I mean, Juan Orlando Hernandez, who was involved with narco gangs. I mean, they're going after him. And well, actually, Honduras didn't even go after him. The U.S. is going after him, which is, you know, but but the point is, in the U.S., there's always been this consensus among political elites that they don't immediately indict their predecessor after gaining power. And it's, you know, this unspoken agreement to maintain political stability inside the U.S. It's why, you know, Obama wouldn't go after George W. Bush for, I think, some of the most indictable offenses. Uh, lying to the public about Iraq, lying and um, committing torture. Uh, there, there are so many ways that George W. Bush could have been indicted. And just from a moral and ethical point of view he should have been jailed, but he wasn't. Donald Trump is now being indicted and there's no way not to see this in the same light as so many of the other lawfare campaigns in countries that the US considers undemocratic. And it's just so obvious to me that, I mean, yes, you can, you can, you can I'm sure you can find, maybe you can find something on Trump, but it's so obvious to me from the quality of these indictments so much of what they're targeting him for and his associates is for speech. For example, for his Twitter DMs, uh, you have a judge in Beryl Howell who oversaw the trial of the Venezuelan Embassy Protection Collective, which we were all a part of, uh, who was proved to be the biggest State Department tool, the biggest deep state tool in that trial. His handing over uh, Trump's DMs, and then you look at the uh, you look at the indictment, and it's like Trump and asked the vice president to appoint electors like we he he asked his vice president to do something uh trump questioned openly questioned the election results this is in the uh the federal indictment on uh january 6 he openly questioned the election results knowing that it was not true as though <laughs> the prosecutor somehow knows what trump thinks. right so whatever you think of trump He's being prosecuted in so many cases for things he said, questioning the election. Um, and that it will never happen to Hillary Clinton, despite having said the exact same thing first, right? In an even crazier way that, you know, Russia hacked right. the voting machines, which right. most Democrats still believe. Right. Um, and where's the proof of that? You know? Yeah. I mean, and, that you know, was the first, that was the first big lie, as they called January 6th, that, that, uh, that really violated what we consider, you know, democratic norms in, in the United States. I think it's just that questioning of, of election results. And it was, it was the whole campaign was spearheaded by Hillary Clinton and, and, and her, you know, circle of her, her cabal of, uh, of angry Democrats who are now, you know, running the Ukraine war, you know? Well, the 2000 election was straight up stolen. It was right before eyes. It was stolen by political associates of Bush on the Supreme Court and in Florida, including his brother. It was, and the, the, I went out to the protest it in 2000 and the protests were small because the Democratic Party didn't want to fight. And right. Al Gore was at the top of the Democratic Party. He's a guy who'd been raised in all these uh, preppy schools to be prepared to be the president since he was like a fetus by his dad, who was a senator in Tennessee. Uh, and he was a right-wing Democrat who actually proposed a higher military budget than Bush 
And the, the, the line on Bush was he's going to be a caretaker president and we'll just have it back in four years. He's not going to, you know, then 9-11 happened and it became clear that this should have been fought. Jesse Jackson had been uh, begging Al Gore to bring Operation Push down to Florida and Gore, he didn't want to have a January 6th style moment. But that is what should have happened when an election is stolen. You have, you're supposed to go out and fight for democracy. Um, so I'm, I'm just saying, and, and then the Democrats in Congress went out and called it a stolen election. They used the same language that many of the Republicans use about 2020, which was a weird election. And there was rigging took place in other ways, like with the cover up of the Hunter Biden laptop and the 80 uh, intelligence or former intelligence officials lying about the Hunter Biden laptop. So there was cause for it all. But it's obvious to me that if Donald Trump had not, for example, destroyed the legacy of the Bush family over Iraq and 9-11, humiliating them on the national stage, if he hadn't humiliated John McCain uh, to great applause from Vietnam veterans and shown that John McCain's true base was among the Beltway press corps and he was not an actual American hero, if he hadn't paused the attempted to suspend Ukraine aid if he hadn't held a summit with Vladimir Putin, if he hadn't embraced Kim Jong-un after ridiculously calling him Rocket Man, if he hadn't insulted the Beltway press corps after they attempted to paint him as a Russian puppet, if he hadn't gone after the FBI after it wiretapped Trump Tower, after if he hadn't done all of these things that violated the unspoken consensus where the president is just essentially a figurehead for an unelected deep state, even when Trump rolled over for that same deep state and did what it wanted and brought John Bolton and H.R. McMaster into the building, it was what Trump said that made him the enemy. If he hadn't done all that, you wouldn't see all these indictments. And the latest indictment is just so obvious what they're trying to do. They're trying to force Trump and all of his associates to be in court in Fulton County over and over for endless hearings throughout the campaign season to prevent him from being on the campaign trail. And you're seeing the gulf between the national media that's orgasming collectively over these indictments and the Republican base, which where Trump maintains like 68% support. He's still oh, far and away the front runner. There's no way that anyone can touch him at this point. It creates the possibility, I'm not saying it's a high possibility, of a Repub of a of someone getting elected while behind bars. Uh, yeah, I mean, an and amazing and it, symbol of American democracy. I mean, one of the truest ex uh, symbols of American democracy. Well, it, show, it shows the lack of thinking on the, the part of the Democrats, because, you know, every time that they impeached him, he got he reached new records in his popularity rating. And so now they're, you know, going after him with this sprawling lawfare campaign with multiple cases, uh, everything ranging from sexual assault and payments to porn stars to, you know, inciting a, uh, insurrection. Uh, and it's just, it's just, you know, DeSantis has gone down <laughs> and that support has all gone to Donald Trump. Uh, nobody else is really breaking out of that, you know, single digit, uh, field. And because, because people, you know, this is, I mean, it's, it, it's just an amazingly, uh, stupid, tactic to think that, you know, indicting him over and over and over again, just like impeaching him over and over again, wouldn't, you know, rally his base and, and allow them to uh, coalesce around their, you know, embattered uh, man, you know? Yeah. I mean, and what, the, the, how, how else is Biden? Biden's running again. I mean, it's inconceivable that he's running again. I mean, he needs to be in Hawaii. Any political animal like a Bill Clinton or a Chris Christie or even a Barack Obama is not yeah. the same retail political figure they are. They would be in Hawaii. They would All they have to do is show a little bit of compassion and their poll numbers will go up. He can't go because he's just too elderly and in, he's practically infirm. He's sitting out at the beach trying to, you know, uh, survive. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. It's not anything against elderly people. It's hard to be president and be active, but he cannot go out there and do that. He says no comment on Hawaii. He didn't even know what the reporter was probably 
shouting to him, but you know, you should have. No, I'm going to the beach here, actually, not uh, not um, Hawaii. This is, I'm, I'd rather be at the you know dingy, uh, cold Atlantic waters of Rehoboth <laughs> in these uh, you know soaking in the cigarette butts in the sand here, uh, you know, next to discarded koozies and whatnot. I, you know, but no, I mean, yeah, Rehoboth. But you 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 would if you were actually a, like alive, you would be in Hawaii as president. That's all I'm saying. And, and, uh, and then the excuse is, uh, we don't want Joe Biden to uh, disrupt the rescue efforts that are underway. I mean, the, the humanitarian aid efforts that are underway. Uh, so we'll send $700 to everyone. And then Biden's asking for 20 billion to Ukraine. I mean, he's completely out of it. And what I'm saying is he's, he's one, he's one of the most vulnerable incumbents in recent history. Trump was also a very vulnerable incumbent because all of official Washington had trained its guns on him. Biden is vulnerable because it, it's just hard to take him seriously at this point. Um, and so what they're doing with these indictments is they're hoping that if they can not at least get uh, secretaries of state and blue states to take Trump off the ballot, that they can at least get sort of the suburban some of the suburban swing voters that supported Trump uh, to turn against him because they just see him as a criminal and they support law and order. Um, I don't even know if that's going to work. I can't. Well, I think it's also just about it's associating Trump with just this like just this kind of never ending spectacle. And that was that was a big part of Biden's appeal, too. It's like, oh, we're just going to things are going to go back to normal. and You won't have to think about politics every day anymore. And it's kind of like a threat. It's like a, it's like, oh, if you elect this guy, then you're going to have to think about the things that your country is doing again. And you're going to be, it's going to be in the news every single day. It's just kind of, it's, it's, it's like a, an implied threat almost to me, the, the way that, that they treat the, the Trump spectacle now. It's like, okay, we're going to, we're going to force Americans to endure our never ending Trump hysteria again. Yeah. I mean, someone says there, there are people saying in the chat, oh, I'm, I'm just sucking up to the right and what and whatnot and MAGA. That's not what this is about. This is about how, mark my words, after this goes down, it set a precedent and every administration will do this to their predecessor from now on if their predecessor is from the other party. And they will especially, unless, unless they are like a Chris Christie Republican or a Barack Obama Democrat, and they adhere to the unspoken rules of the Uniparty, like the Uniparty, Cory Booker, Senator from New Jersey, and Chris Christie, former governor from New Jersey, shared over 240 major donors. They essentially are the same person from different parties. And Chris Christie and Cory Booker have run for president from separate parties. Why did they run? Why are they running? Chris Cory Booker ran as one of the like 40 million candidates that ran to create a shell game so that they could eventually all pull out after getting some guarantees of something from the Obama power network in order to screw over Bernie Sanders so that to clear the way for Biden. That's why they ran them. And that's why so many Republicans, whether it's Tim Scott, this unknown Senator from South Carolina, whose entire campaign is funded by Oracle CEO, Larry Ellison. Uh, all the money is coming from Larry Ellison, whose home and ma mega mansion in Hawaii mysteriously, well, not mysteriously, but it survived the fire. Um, you know, Tim Scott, Chris Christie, and none of them have any popular support within the Republican Party. It's all to try to use the same tactics against Trump. And they're all controlled by the same donor class. And those people are supposed to be president. If someone like a Bernie Sanders, even a soft milk toast social Democrat who breaks a little bit from the consensus were to somehow enter the White House and leave, they the, 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 the indictment precedent would come into play to make sure that this never happened again. So that's, that's what I'm talking about here. And the fact that George W. Bush and Dick Cheney were not indicted, it just, I, there's no way I can ever take this seriously. Stormy right. Daniels, you're getting indicted 
over a bookkeeping error for some sleazy affair you had with a porn star. Okay, you're sleazy, whatever. But like, I can see I can, see, Dick, I can see Chris Christie Halliburton alone. Yeah, right. I can see Chris Christie on the debate stage already, just getting really sweaty and upset and saying, "I met with Zelensky, and he's you know heroically defend." I mean, that was the most pathetic, uh, almost as pathetic as DeSantis's Israel trip. You know, just going to Ukraine to meet with him when you're you're a nobody. He got he he barely passed. Uh, I mean, I don't think he passed like ten percent at any point in polls uh, last time he ran. Um, you know what what what's he known for for shutting down a bridge to spite a, a, a neighboring <laughs> governor? He's known for spending uh, millions of taxpayer dollars at concessions at football stadiums. You know, for for snacks. He was getting uh, pumped up by the national media and he became popular as governor because he was refusing to raise taxes to pay for this major transportation overhaul that was going to connect urban North Jersey and New York City, uh, which would have been extremely important to relieve traffic in the Holland Tunnel. Um, and he said, no, there's no way I'm going to do it. I'm actually going to cut the pensions on the teachers. And then he started taking on the teachers unions and screaming at the teachers. And the national media loves that because they're all rich people who love war. Um, and so Chris Christie's their guy. Like you look at Chris Christie in studio with Jake Tapper, Jake Tapper would like volunteer to be eaten by Chris Christie. Like he would <laughs> lather himself in vitamin E and go down Chris Christie's throat uh, because he's talking about fiscal responsibility, fiscal conservatism and, and, uh, you know, but 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 Trump, he, we need the rule of law and we need to support Zelensky with everything we had. It's like when you go to dinner with these people and when, when they, they identify themselves, it's like, what do you do? You ask, like, what do you, they all do? The what do you do? And then they talk about like where they stand politically and they all say and, they, and to avoid to take the edge off. The, the Democrats will always be like, well, I'm 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 a fiscally conservative, but I'm socially <laughs> liberal. In other words, like, you know, I'll sleep with your wife, but uh, I cut my taxes because I, I live in Bethesda. And, uh, and so Chris Christie's like perfect for them. So that's how he well, became popular. 60 Minutes did this whole special on him. And then he went to, um, uh, what was it? The, 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 there was the, the hurricane, Sandy Point or whatever. And uh, like parts of the beach communities in New Jersey got d destroyed. And he went and he like, he's like, I'm taking leadership. And he right. would just give these blustery uh, stentorian speeches and he would show compassion, uh, which is like Biden can't do. He can't be in Hawaii because it's a long flight, I guess. By the way, we have another contributor, Jeremy Lafredo, who's on the ground in Lahaina right now. He, he just got there. So we're going to be providing coverage from Hawaii. Thanks to your support. I mean, thanks to you who are watching this. We're able to do that on a shoestring. Uh, these are like some of the hardest working people in journalism. And I'm hoping that I'm, I'm thinking we're going to be in South Africa covering bricks. Uh, so I just dropped the link in there in the chat to support us. You know, if, if you believe in what we're doing, if you agree with us always being right, then you should support us being on the ground. Uh, five bucks, whatever. Uh, so yeah, that's, it's, do you remember when the Democrats were against uh, indicting uh, Trump, indicting people? They call it, when this, this is position uh, to do it. We now know they really have been trying to gin up criminal prosecutions and criminal investigations into the president's perceived enemies, politically motivated persecution. Right, courtesy of Bill Barr. I'll I'll roll in the FBI on you. That's how banana republics work, right? <laughs> 45th president of the United States is included by the FBI. Mr. Trump is using the Justice Department to go after his perceived enemies. I feel worried about the prospect of the Justice Department being used as a tool of this president or any. In our mm. banana republic, any capable prosecutor can get a grand jury to hand down an indictment of something as innocent as a ham sandwich. Today, an indictment is in <laughs> charging Donald Trump. Breaking news on former President Trump. He's been indicted for the fourth time in five months. Bill Barr, on the president's behalf, is weaponizing the Justice Department to go after the president's enemies. When you win an election, you don't seek to just prosecute the losing side. The president using the Justice Department as a weapon to get what he wants. 
Department of Justice is totally politicized. Sticking the Department of Justice on political opponents. Threatening to imprison his political rival, Banana Republic style. Trying to exact revenge against all of his enemies. Tin pot dictator in a Banana Republic. Is that <laughs> More like a banana republic dictator. He's using government resources to go after his political opponent. Um, essentially, we are a banana republic. That we are, we are um, seeking to have a bogus and criminal investigation into a political opponent. And that's using the Department of Justice to also target Trump's political opponent for nefarious reasons. This is a massive abuse of power and a betrayal of our values. The President of the United States is targeting a family member of a political opponent. This is a type of thing that happens in a <laughs> banana republic. And trying to take out a political rival in Joe Biden. Criminally investigating an American political rival, someone the president is worried about losing to in the next election. To investigate uh, my principal opponent or a principal opponent uh, in the upcoming election. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> Don't you think that's something that should be investigated when the incumbent political party opens a counterintelligence investigation on the candidate of the opposing party? We know Trump is itching to politicize the Justice Department and the attorney general has been super shady. The president is weaponizing the Department of Justice to bring cases against his enemies. The Department of Justice in a, is in an existential crisis. Again, it's yet another example of the Justice Department basically losing all of its independence in this administration. This is all right. We can go on forever, yes. uh, but uh, it really does feel ironic. And uh, yes. It just shows you none of these people believe anything. You know, they just, no. none of them believe anything and they will say anything they think they can get away with. And because they run the media, they can get away with anything. Yeah. They get fed their talking points. And then in the next administration, when the imperatives of their party shift, they say the exact opposite. And so like I was watching CNN on the Georgia grand jury and they were all saying that this, that the, they, they got the talking points from, you know, democratic CENTCOM. And it was that this shows the beauty of our system, that this shows that w they, they kept saying black women. They kept, it was obvious that they were told to say black women. That's the, the plaintiffs are black women. And that this is what, what they're doing is standing up for the voting rights of black women against this racist white nationalist leader and that working class people have a voice in the justice department. And it was left to Van Jones to really ram that point home. Van Jones being a uh, former uh, street organizer in the Bay area Maoist. Of, a, of a revolutionary Maoist organization <laughs> called storm who then uh, saw his future in the o Obama era as a political hack and is now a CNN commentator. And here's what a former revolutionary Maoist had to say. Uh, <laughs> a bigger slice of America than even just these, these little cowardly candidates to start talking about the, the beauty of our institution. This is a beautiful system that we have. Uh, the beauty of our institution. Those are like the, the beautiful system. He used to defend, he used to like protest against police brutality. Now he's saying this is a beautiful system we have. He used to spell America with three Ks. Yeah, he's one of those 3K America guys. I'm a 3K American. <laughs> it reminds you of the glory of the American experiment. Well, That's listen what to what I he did. says next. People around the world don't have this. People around the world don't have this. Well, this is exactly what people <laughs> yeah. around the world have. They have endless indictments of the last government by their opponents who might have come in on the back of a U.S. coup or who knows what. That's exactly what we're seeing in countries around the world. That's the banana right. republic that the democratic operatives and consultants were all referring to back in 2019 when Trump started to investigate Hunter Biden in Ukraine, which the Republican Congress is now looking at because there was a lot there. And by the way, if our system is so beautiful, let's just say you support the Trump indictments. Let's just take that off the table. If our system is so beautiful and we all enjoy equal treatment under the law, then why was Hunter Biden offered a plea agreement after all he did by David Weiss, who has now been appointed as the special, as the independent prosecutor? 
Why do some people who smoke crack end up 20 years? And yeah. And I mean, if his name was Hunter Johnson, he'd be up to he'd be up the river. Right. So. Well, yeah, you can if you're if you're Biden's son, you can smoke as much crack as you want. Um, get off scot free. Anybody else, Biden's locking you up in prison for what three, four times as long as somebody who is doing cocaine. You know, the original. I mean, he was the original uh, architect of really the modern uh, carceral Mandatory crisis. Mandatory minimums. That's yeah. such a good. That's that's such a key point. Is that Joe Biden is responsible for the long-term incarceration of so many poor people, disproportionately black for nonviolent drug crimes, while his son gets a plea deal from a guy who's now been promoted to independent solicitor or prosecutor. Yeah, I mean, more, more or less the same as Kamala Harris, right? Yeah, I mean, she, on a smaller scale, though, I mean, Biden really played a decisive role in mass incarceration in the U.S. Um, I mean, it just it it doesn't get any more clear that there are two. We have a two tiered system of justice, and to so to spin uh, the Trump indictments as some kind of uh, tribute to the beauty of America's system of equal justice by someone who was a former revolutionary Maoist protesting police brutality just highlights the farcical world we live in, in this country. So I said it better myself. Well, you said it, you said it well, and uh, we sh we'll do more of these live streams. Uh, thanks to everyone's support uh, because we're, we are going to be able to provide Wyatt and Alex and Kit with more dedicated support than we have in the past. Thanks to all of you who've donated, all 738 of you. We crossed the 70K mark during this live stream, thanks to your generosity. I'm gonna throw the link in there one more time. Do what you can. This is all going to them. Um, and like, as I said, uh, we have Jeremy Lafredo now on the ground in Hawaii. He'll be reporting for us from there. And, uh, We'll be, um, um, we're going to be reporting from BRICS, this historic event that I, I think is going to open up a new dawn for a part of the world where most people live, which has been neglected and blighted, particularly since the period of unipolar U.S. hegemony of the 1990s. Uh, so we're going to tell that story here with reporting and interviews. And it's uh, once again, it's thanks to you, our audience, that we can do that. There's a part of me that likes to think of the gray zone as kind of the bricks of media. You know, <laughs> we've been, we've been prevented from participating in this system um, because we don't toe the line and we won't spit the propaganda that they want us to. So you know what? we're going to make our own thing, you know, and now we're able to expand. I think it's incredible. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm honored to be a part of the team. I'm, I'm touched that so many people uh, find so much value in what we do. Definitely. We're the, or, or Briggs, we're the G. Um, and, and, and thank you, Pamela. Uh, Aloha, Pamela. I, uh, well, yeah, well, yeah, we'll be back next week. Check us out on Pacifica. I don't know if there's anything you want to add, Alex, before we go. No, I mean, just kind of to reiterate what I had said earlier that, you know, the gray zone is doing a kind of journalism that uh, nobody else is. And, you know, I really believe that, um, as Julian Assange said, if wars can be started with lies, then peace can be started with truth. And since there's so few uh, places where you can find the truth these days. Um, we, we really appreciate your support and it helps us, uh, you know, do our best to, uh, you know, expose the bastards and, 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 and keep the, the torch of, of, of real, uh, investigative journalism that challenges power and challenges the empire and challenges war alive. Uh, so, you know, so much thanks to all of you. All right. Well, well said and uh we'll be we'll be back next week maybe aaron will be back uh with a completed draft of his book we'll see but either way uh 
we'll be there. And we're, I, I think next week's going to be a, a very big week for us. Uh, as I said, for field reporting, and we've got some really good pieces in the pipeline for this weekend. So uh, watch this space, uh, thegrayzone.com, and uh, support us one more time. Here's the here's that link. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it in there one more time and leave you with this. And uh, this this my my appeal starts with. Uh, you know, it's a personal appeal and it speaks to what Wyatt said. I founded the gray zone because there was simply nowhere else for me and many other independent journalists to go. By the time we launched as a fully independent outlet in 2018, mainstream press was a largely sold out propaganda factory. And even the supposedly alternative outlets that once provided us with a sanctuary from the corporate media had succumbed to imperialist narratives. You know who they are. And so I think we're doing something unique. There are other great publications out there that also deserve your support, but I think we're doing something totally unique and we couldn't do without you. So one last time, and then I'm going to go. Right on. All right. Peace, everybody. We're out. Take care.